It's a pleasure to see you this morning. My name is Roy Stingstrom. I have the privilege of serving as the president of the University of Montana. I've done that for a little over a year at this point, and uh, it's just such an enjoyable job. It's the greatest job in the world, is what I tell people. I'm delighted to see all of you here uh, for today's outing. I hope you didn't have to drive through uh, too much bad weather to get here this morning or walk through too much snow. Uh, it looks like a good February Montana day out there. Well, I do want to welcome you on behalf of everybody at the University of Montana. We're so pleased to have this kind of event uh, here on our campus, uh, the Women's uh, Small Business Opportunity Forum. Uh, this is so consistent with the kinds of things that we are interested in here at the University of Montana. Uh, and still, I'm delighted to welcome Senator Tester here and Mayor Ingen. Thank you both for being here, and uh, thank you, Senator, for setting this up and uh, the hard work that your staff has put into this. The program looks wonderful. Uh, I see uh, the names of uh, so many people with tremendous experience and knowledge on there, so I think you're going to learn a great deal today, and I hope to see that this is a very interactive uh, kind of a session. I'm sure it will be. I'm especially pleased that uh, the, the first speaker will be Jackie Moore, uh, who is uh, one of our uh, real sources of pride and joy here at the university. Jackie is one of our newest regents professor, and in her case, professor of marketing. That's the highest uh, honor that we can bestow upon a faculty member here at the university. So you're in for a, a real treat in listening to Jackie this morning. Here at the university, we have a new plan that we call UM 2020, Building a University for the Global Century. And this is about trying to provide education uh, appropriate for today's world, making sure that our students leave here with the, kind of, with the kind of education that allows them to hit the ground running upon graduation or upon uh, whatever they choose as their next step in education. And uh, one of the subparts of building a university for the global century is called uh, Discovery and Creativity to Serve Montana and the World. This is about moving ideas from the university into the private sector in large measure. And I'm so pleased that uh, we have a hardworking group of people uh, working on doing exactly that here at the university. This conference today, I think, is so consistent with that message. Uh, so I'm pleased that you're going to be able to spend the day here on our campus immersed in, in a discussion about how to move ideas into the private sector yourselves and how to uh, become successful business people yourselves. So at this point, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce to you uh, a good friend of mine, a good friend of the universities, uh, Mayor John Ingen. He has been uh, the driving force behind the Missoula Economic Partnership, a new activity here, a new effort in Missoula to increase the business, to improve the business climate and increase the productivity of uh, Montana's own economic world. Uh, and so it's my pleasure to introduce to you Mayor John Ingen. Much, President Ingstrom. Always a pleasure to be here at the University of Montana. Always a pleasure to spend a little time with Senator Tester. Neither of us will be injured today is our strategy. That's what we come up with, right? Uh, so it occurs to me as I look upon the audience today that I have been married to a small business owner uh, since 1996. I was actually married to her before that, but she became a small business owner with me in tow in 1996. And I can tell you that the beauty of small business is that uh, you have remarkable independence. Nobody tells you which 80 hours a week you're going to work. <laughs> and I've seen her work many, many hours. Um, you know, and it's interesting as I think about the program today, in a lot of ways, when we bought our business in 1996, it really felt as if we were going alone. We were inexperienced. Um, we had uh, financial challenges at that point, um, and we learned by attending the School of Hard Knocks, which wasn't a lot different from Hellgate High School where I went to school for a number of years, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, and, and only over time did we, we start to find some opportunities to network, to start to connect with other people with whom we could commiserate, with whom we could discuss ideas, uh, who had lots to offer us. Today, the opportunity, I think, is for you all 
to recognize that you don't have to go it alone, that there is tremendous opportunity and tremendous support today for you all to succeed. Um, that success is not just a product of hard work, it's a product of folks coming together to support you. So with the Missoula Economic Partnership, we've come to recognize that we can't go it alone either. Missoula city government can't go it alone. County government can't go it alone. Our great institutions like the University of Montana can't go it alone. Folks at the state can't go it alone. But we're all in this together. And so by working together, we create these opportunities and we create the energy and support around you to help you do what you need to do, which is succeed, grow wealth, and create or recreate the middle class, not only in Missoula, but in the region, we hope in the state. So Senator Tester, it's always a pleasure to see you, my friend, a guy who knows small business inside and out, uh, actually operates a small business as a nonprofit. Is that correct? That's farming, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, as I recall that, uh, not intentional indeed, I know the feeling. At any rate, ladies and gentlemen, a great friend to the state of Montana, uh, a man who sincerely cares about the people he serves all day long. Um, and just never relents in his efforts to make it all work for us. Senator Tester. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, John. Mayor Ingham, thank you very, very much. I appreciate the kind words and, and the words about business in general. And Roy, thank you for uh, what your, your work that you've done here at the university uh, in your tenure so far, and we hope it's a long one, and this university continues to grow and be all it can be. It's a, we're very, um, we're very fortunate in Montana to have a university system that's such an incredible economic driver to this state, so we appreciate that. Uh, before we start uh, with my formal remarks, I'd like you all to stand, if you can, and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I want to first of all thank you for taking time out of uh, this Tuesday. I, uh, uh, it's great to have you all here. We were wondering this morning what impacts the roads we're going to have, because uh, as you folks well know firsthand, they are very slick. So thank you all for taking time out of your Tuesday to be here. I'm going to be uh, quick because we do have uh, a great uh, group of folks on the agenda today to uh, to uh, to express some information over to uh, to the small business folks here and the potential small business folks that are here. Uh, but I want to first explain why uh, I put this. This is my tenth small business workshop. We've held them around the state. Um, Bozeman, Billings, Butte, Great Falls, and uh, Kalispell, and, and of course here in Missoula. I hold, held my first event after uh, getting some, um, well, some complaints, quite frankly, from some small businesses in Montana that weren't getting access to, to government contracts. Um, and there was a lot of them out there uh, through, through the Defense Department and through uh, well, just a myriad of contracts. And they were um, we were concerned because, uh, quite honestly, the federal government wasn't fishing far from the boat when it came to doing their contracting. So we brought the folks up uh, who do the contracting, uh, and a lot of businesses showed up, small businesses, brought the federal agencies in, and had an opportunity to uh, level the playing field and, uh, and really bring a different level of accountability to, uh, to federal government contracting to make sure that they understand the kind of businesses we had here in Montana and understand the opportunities that the government would get, that the taxpayer would get, from contracting with these businesses. And uh, that first workshop worked. And since then, uh, we've been able to make these programs even better. Um, one of the things I hear over and over again is the need for access to capital and how critically important that is for businesses to be able to not only be successful, but also grow in that success. And so um, getting back to the state every weekend, uh, get around, talk to folks, um, see the innovative things that they're doing in our, in our, in our business across the state. Uh, and it, it is clear that each one of these businesses have different challenges uh, because they're, they're different stages of growth. And uh, so um, they need to have resources along the way at every stage. Um, I also heard the, the need for, uh, for more information. Uh, Montana's entre entrepreneurs, particularly Montana's women entrepreneurs. And so today we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Jackie Moore, who's the uh, marketing professor here at the University of Montana. We're going to hear from Sharon Bosnick, who uh, is the CEO of Astia, a nonprofit dedicated to the success of women-led 
high growth businesses will discover the resources available uh, to all Montanans from community developed organizations to banks to angel investors will be let in on some of the secrets of success from Montana small businesses like uh, Burns Bakery and Betty's Divine. Of course, one of the most important things of this event is something you can't put on the agenda, and that's the people you meet and, uh, and the connections you make and the opportunities that happen from networking. And uh, I call these uh, small business opportunity workshops for a reason, uh, so uh, please keep me posted. But before we begin, I want to say a big thank you once again to everybody who's here today, whether you're a participant or a guest. Uh, it's great to be here. We're going to be streaming uh, this entire event on my website. So a big welcome to those people who uh, are joining us via the Internet. And uh, the interest in this workshop, I think, uh, says a lot about Montana's willingness uh, to find new opportunities to grow business and to create jobs. All the things that uh, that Royce talked about and, uh, and Mayor Engen talked about. So with that, um, I, um, we'll, we'll get to it. Uh, Jackie Moore uh, is our first speaker. Um, she is the Jeff and Martha Hamilton Distinguished Faculty Fellow here at the University of Montana. She is an expert at marketing products and services. And if you've taken marketing high tech at any university, chances are you're going to be using a tool that she wrote. Uh, she'll give us some tips for successful marketing campaigns. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Moore to the podium. you these days I'm always so glad to live here because I just love the snow and I love the winter and I wish it was always a little colder and a little snowier. So. <laughs> um, as Senator Tester said, my specialty is actually in the marketing of technology driven products and so some of the examples that I'll use today come from that industry. It's always difficult to give a marketing talk to a very diverse group of businesses because every industry has its own unique approach to marketing. So just so I have a sense of the audience here, how many of you would characterize your business as a retail business? Okay. How many of you would characterize your business as a service that you provide? Okay. How many of you are in uh, the manufacturing sector? Okay. Now, those are some common classifications, and of course, manufacturing, service, and retail all have very different marketing considerations. And so, as I go through my material today, you're going to find you might need to tweak it a little bit for your own industry. You may find that some of what I talk about doesn't seem to be directly applicable to your industry, in which case it may need some adaptation. But my objective is to make sure that when you leave here that you picked up at least three to five new things that you hadn't thought of for marketing that you want to go back with and do what I call a pilot project. You should be doing experiments in marketing. And experiments mean that you try something new and then you collect data to actually assess whether or not it worked. How many of you would characterize your marketing efforts as successful already, that you're happy with them? <laughs> oh my goodness, okay. Okay, so I've got one very proud person in the back, so that is awesome. Um, and the fact is, what makes marketing particularly difficult is that we don't know how to measure success very often. And so what I'd like to talk about today, in addition to some ideas, suggestions, strategies, is also this very important issue of how do you actually know when your marketing is working. So my agenda today, let's see. Okay, critical ingredients of marketing strategy. Uh, when I say the word marketing, many people think that means advertising. The fact is the ads that you run really don't make a difference if you don't have a foundation of the essential strategic decisions first. And so I'm going to go through the strategic decisions before we get to discussions about advertising or sales. Okay, so that's the first thing that we want to talk about is the strategy behind the marketing. It's also critically important that you have a sense of uh, the data that you need to make good marketing decisions. Marketing decisions are not based on intuition and gut reactions. Many people think that good marketers 
have somehow this intuitive feel for it. But the fact is good marketing requires good homework and good data. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the types of data that you need. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about are some tools to help you make those decisions. And some of the talk is actually going to be a little bit technical to give a flavor of some of these tools to make decisions. And as I go through some of the technical aspects of the talk, I don't want you to um, lose sight of the purpose today. This isn't a hands-on workshop on marketing. It's to give you a flavor of what some of those tools are. And if you're more interested in learning about more tools, seeking out resources to help you learn what those tools might be. Okay, so the first thing we have to agree on is what does the word marketing even mean? Because when you ask five different people what marketing means, oftentimes you get five very different answers. And at its heart, marketing essentially means what the opportunities are in the environment, what the trends are, and how you come to adapt your business model to take advantage of those trends. Okay, now think about that. That's a really different definition than saying it's the ads that you run or it's the sales promotion and price strategies that you have. Marketing is forward-looking. You should be looking out into the future and how far out into the future actually depends on your industry and your customer purchase cycle. If you're selling to customers that have annual budgets and you're going to be asking them to obsolete some of the equipment that they may have, you're talking about a three to five year trajectory oftentimes. If you're talking about a retail business where things are coming at you pretty quickly in terms of the competitive environment, your time horizon is going to be shorter. But the idea of marketing is actually looking into the future to anticipate the trends that are happening that you need to be accounting for in your strategic decisions today. So it's this simultaneously juggling both the far-term strategies with the near-term strategies. And sometimes this is a really difficult juggling act because you have only so much time in front of you. And how do you allocate that time between the near-term and the future? And the best businesses actually juggle both of those simultaneously. Okay, so in order to do that, you also have to know exactly what your customer's pain points are. Because marketing is not so much persuading people that you can solve their problems. Marketing is really understanding the problems that your customers have and how what the services that you offer solves their problems. And if you really don't know what your customers' problems are, it's very tough to craft a marketing strategy because oftentimes we call that either a spray and pray approach, which you don't want to do, or you're put in this position of trying to be really aggressive in doing a hard sell, which best practices marketing should not be a hard sale. You should know your customer's pain points so well that when they experience that, they turn to you as a trusted provider. And I'm going to come back to more of this trusted provider uh, perspective as well. Okay, so then marketing also is decisions about which customers, segmentation, targeting, and positioning. And if you haven't made decisions about which customers you're choosing not to serve, and you're treating all customers as equally viable, then odds are you haven't made some hard business decisions. Okay, so marketing is segmentation, which customers. And then we get to what most people think marketing is. What is the product I'm going to offer? What is the price I'm going to sell it at? What promotion strategies am I going to use? Which partners am I going to have? These are sometimes known as the four Ps of marketing that you see up here. But really, crafting those four Ps depends on the prior decisions. OK, so let's get started. That's kind of a, a, a very broad overview of when I say the word marketing, at its heart, it's the strategy of matching your decisions today against future opportunities. That is what marketing is. Okay, so getting started, the key strategic decision that all businesses must make is captured in this Venn diagram. And the Venn diagram essentially identifies a sweet spot. And that sweet spot says, who are my customers? What value do I offer them? 
and how am I as a company going to deliver and execute on that value? Okay, now I'm going to give a common example that most of us are familiar with to illustrate this notion of the strategy sweet spot and some of the implications that this decision makes. Okay, all of us are familiar with the Apple Computer and the products that it makes. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, when you think of Apple Computer, it has a very narrow product line compared to a traditional consumer electronics company. Mm -hmm. And it offers its products at a premium position in the marketplace, meaning that Apple chooses to sell high-end products at a high-end price. And if you are a retailer of Apple products, you have a very strict contract that says you will not sell on price. You will not have price promotions. And although we have very good antitrust regulations in this country about vertical price fixing, the fact is a manufacturer's suggested retail price carries a lot of clout. Now that's a very different business model in terms of high-end customers with a premium value package with a very refined distribution strategy. It's a very different approach than Nokia. In this country, we don't buy a lot of Nokia products any longer. And the fact is, Nokia made a strategic shift several years ago that they thought that the real emerging trend on the horizon was the use of technology in what are called base of the pyramid markets, rural areas in India, China, Africa, where they're going to leapfrog the PC era and go directly to mobile technology based on uh, broadband deployment. And the only way people in those countries can afford cell phones is if they are less than $40. And typically you have to have a very different deployment model where you need a different infrastructure and you have different apps that run on those phones than a lot of the apps we see in this country. And so Nokia's strategy about which customers was based on a volume play, not margin. The value proposition that's offered is to empower people through technology to improve their lives. And the distribution strategy is very, very broad deployment in these rural areas. It's a very difficult distribution strategy, actually. Now I could go into some of the differences between these two companies in terms of the type of research that they do and other implications, but you can see that the strategy sweet spot, it's not that one is the right strategy and one is the wrong strategy, it's that they have different strategies and that strategy sweet spot is consistent for each of them. Apple has said all along they are prouder of the products they choose not to make than the products that they do make because it's their narrow focus that allows them to maintain this premium position that they're not diluted across the map in the electronics industry. Okay, now we could bring that home and we could compare other examples about the strategy sweet spot. I'm a chocolate fan. I'm really glad here in Missoula we have some very fine chocolate makers. But Godiva chocolates uh, is a very different sweet spot than Hershey chocolates. Okay, so you have to think from the get-go what is your strategy sweet spot going to be because it does have pretty serious implications. And these implications include, oh my gosh, it feels really risky. You're recommending that I choose not to focus on some possible customers whose revenue could support my business model. And that's right, that's what I am suggesting. And the reason for that focus is because what I said earlier is that marketing means really knowing your customers. And if you spread your efforts across many different types of customers, you simply cannot have the expertise and credibility that it takes to be a trusted, credible provider because you can't know their pain points well enough. So this focus actually allows you to be more successful rather than less successful. Now I could also say that this focus uh, also has implications for resources. When you try to spread your resources across many different types of target markets, it often means you need to attend different industry trade shows. You need to look at different industry trade magazines. You need to think about reaching customers in lots of different types of media venues. You don't have enough resources, any company doesn't, it doesn't matter how big they are, 
to essentially do this spray and pray approach. And so this idea of focus actually allows you to have sufficient threshold or critical mass in the way you extend your resources that you actually have some awareness in that industry. Particularly for small businesses, thinking about this focus is the key to success. And having a niche market that you are known in actually allows you then, if you use the metaphor of a bowling alley, to knock off other pins behind that lead segment once you're successful. But if you go after all the pins spread out evenly across your bowling alley, you know, you're only going to get a couple of them. But if you focus and then use that to extend, you're going to be more successful. Okay. Now, what are some common ways that you can assess what should your focus be? What should your strategy sweet spot be? The whole idea of market segmentation is that it should follow a logical process. And again, with 45 minutes, it's hard to tell you about the process, but I'd be happy to share with you some blogs or reading materials. And I don't know if there's going to be a website to share additional resources, but I would be happy to point people in, in the direction of, OK, how do I make that decision? Essentially, some common ways to segment markets start at the very, very top level with, are you going to go after commercial customers? Or are you going to go after consumers or residential consumers? So let me give you a couple examples. Today, it was really exciting for me to read about the new cheese company up in Polson. How many of you read the article in the Missoulian this morning? OK. Um, the cheese is really good, I have to say. I've, I've had a sample, and it's quite good. But essentially, a, a cheese manufacturer has a decision. Are they going to try to sell cheese to everybody who likes cheese? And this is going to be a high-end cheese. It's not going to be a cheese that competes with Kraft, OK? So right away, we know something about their strategy sweet spot. But going after a mass market of anybody in a particular geographic area, if we just say you know, the Flathead Valley or west of the, the Continental Divide, that's a very different market than, say, I'm going to go after hospitals, schools, restaurants. And that would be a commercial decision. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, the way you support those customers, the way you reach them, is going to be totally different. And to say, I'm going to do both of those at the same time, it can be done, but it requires success in one or the other first. Because what I'm saying is you can't do both simultaneously. It's just a different business model, and small companies overextend themselves. And when you overextend, it's one of the key reasons for failure. OK, another common way to segment markets is based on this idea of a premium position in the market or competing based on a low price business model. OK, now this is a very strategic decision. You have to determine what your customers are willing to pay for if you go with a premium price. And you can't compete on price if that's the approach that you choose. And if you have a premium product, mm -hmm. you absolutely can command a higher price. And I'm going to get into some of the mathematical modeling that's behind marketing decisions, because you have to be good at math to make marketing decisions. You have to be able to pencil out margin. You have to be able to pencil out forecasts. And um, you're probably all very good with penciling out the numbers on your books. You have to be able to do this for your marketing decisions as well. Competing on price essentially means you have a low-cost infrastructure in your business. And a low-cost infrastructure in your business means that allows you to charge a lower price for the products that you sell. And if you don't have a low-cost infrastructure in your business, you cannot compete on price. I'll give two common examples again, just to make the point. If we look at the difference between a low-cost airline like Southwest, how is it that they can deliver a low price fare and still make money? Well, the fact is they've chosen a very different way to deploy their route system so that they don't have to pay high fees at major airports and support a hub and spoke system. The hub and spoke system is actually a fairly expensive cost delivery. In addition, they have a lower cost structure for the way that you make your reservations, the way that you get on the plane, and they're able to make a profit by charging a lower price based on the decisions they make about how to lower the cost of doing business. So those two things go together. 
Another example would be Dell Computers. Dell made a very strategic decision to invest quite a bit in automation technology in order to deliver customized computers at a lower price. It's a very different business model. So if you're going to compete on price, you have to ask, how have you managed to make your business actually a low cost business from the cost side. And otherwise, competing on price is extremely difficult because you ultimately end up squeezing your own margin, and we know what that means. Then it's very hard to, to grow and succeed. OK, and then you can also segment based on industry verticals. So this would be if I'm going after, um, let's say, a manufacturing business, am I going to focus on manufacturing for uh, medical technologies, or am I going to focus on factory uh, automation. So you have to make a decision based on the industry that you go after. And this is a common way to segment markets in technology where you decide, I'm going to focus on technology to automate physicians, or I'm going to focus on technology to automate retailers, or I'm going to focus on technology to automate restaurants. And again, each industry uses technology in a different way. They have a different pain point. So to know your customers well, oftentimes it requires specializing in an industry where they come to you to be the trusted provider to know, how am I going to automate my medical office? It's a very, very different type of language than understanding how to automate a restaurant. <coughs> OK, so that's a little bit on which customers. OK, so once you make a decision of which customers, you really have to do your homework. And I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on this, because the heart of good marketing is understanding customers. And if you don't understand customers, you can't make good marketing decisions. So these are some common questions that you should ask yourself and ask if you know the answers to these questions. Do you know what drives your customers' purchase decisions? Are they looking for total cost of ownership? Are they looking to grow their own revenue? Are they looking to streamline their processes? If you don't know what drives their purchase decisions in your product category, then it's going to be hard to make decisions. What are their pain points I've already talked about? What are your customers' competitive options? The fact is the most serious competition you will face as a small business owner is not customers who are buying from a competitor. It's customers who either do the, the, the service or perform the function in-house. So if it's technology, they choose to perform their own network administration in-house rather than outsource it to a provider, because that's going to be a big change for them to shift to hiring somebody to perform a function. So the most entrenched competitor is actually not the company down the street. It's when a customer performs the function in-house or it's a choose-nothing solution. The fact is the status quo works very well for most businesses. And to ask them to change their behavior requires that they incur some risk. And the minute customers incur risk, they take this wait-and-see approach to making decisions. And that drags out the purchase cycle. And you spend a lot of time selling to them. And you can't understand why they won't pull the trigger. Well, oftentimes, it's because you haven't realized that the competition is this do-nothing. And that is a more serious type of competitor because of this inertial force. So I'm going to give uh, two technical frameworks now to understand customers. And hopefully, the two technical frameworks I give give you a flavor of how to use information to help improve the strategic decisions that you're making in your business. OK, how am I doing so far? Is this speaking to some of your needs? Mm -hmm. yes, OK, OK, good. <laughs> I always laugh when I say that to my students, because what are they going to say? It's horrible. Can't you talk about something else? No, we have no idea what you're saying. So they always say, you know, you're only asking loaded questions. And we know there's only one right answer. It's like, well, no, if it's not working, we can switch midstream. It would be OK. All right, so this is something that the mar marketers have a lot of jargon. And this jargon isn't what matters. This is called a multi-attribute model. And I'm always accused of saying things in a really complex way. And the fact is, I love multi-syllable words. And I love to win at Scrabble. And you have to have multi-syllable words to win at Scrabble. But in this particular case, it's not the word that matters. It's the idea behind the framework. Okay, So let's take a minute and look at this framework. 
this is a true company from Missoula, Montana that had me in one morning to do a workshop with some of their people. And I can't do workshops with companies if they don't have data to work with because marketing decisions are based on data and information. And I said, okay, what I'm gonna need to help you all with your segmentation decision is I'm gonna need you to bring to the table some information about what are the key decision criteria that customers make when they make a decision to buy your product. What are those key decision criteria? Okay, and I'm just gonna say generally, because I always try to protect the confidentiality of companies that I work with. Um, this is a, a software company, and you'll see that represented by the characteristics on the left-hand side here essentially are the decision criteria that customers make when they make a decision in this software category. How scalable is the solution? Will that software package grow as my business grows? Or am I gonna have to switch to a new provider if I add lots of new customers, new employees? And the number of parentheses is an importance rating. And this is from your customer's perspective. And we go through this all the time in marketing. Customers' perceptions are the basis for their decisions. And you may disagree that they're using the wrong criteria, and you may disagree that they don't understand that the criteria should be weighted differently. But the fact is, that is the basis for your customer's decision. And so we can talk about how you change perceptions, but you have to start with knowing what the perceptions are because that is the starting point. It's like any map. If you're gonna use Google Maps on your phone, unless you plug in where you're starting from, the app does not work, okay? So this is the baseline, the perceptions that you're starting with. So we have security uh, on a one to 10 scale. This is perceptual data. On a scale from one to 10, how important is scalability? On a scale from one to 10, how important is security? On a scale from one to 10, how important is ease of use? And the fact is, you don't have to spend a lot of money on marketing research. You can spend a lot of money on marketing research. But what I find is that the collective wisdom inside your company typically can answer these questions. And you have to put yourself in the customer's mindset. And the best people to understand the customers are the people who call on the customers day in and day out because they understand them. And what I hear frequently in technology businesses, our customers are stupid. They just don't get what they should be doing. And yes, it sounds really disparaging, but it speaks to this disconnect between the sophistication and the savvy that you have as the expert in the industry and this disconnect or this chasm between how the customers make decisions. Because what they're experts in is not software, okay? So it's your job to really meet them in their space. And, and we may disagree with that space, but that is the starting point. Okay, and then what we see here is you put your company in the first column, and then you identify your key competitors. And this is a simplified example. Typically, the competitors include your direct competitors, and you always have to include your indirect competitors. So if, if I'm in the business of selling coffee to the University of Montana, one of my indirect competitors could actually be other types of beverages, okay? Because the fact is, I don't only compete on coffee. Or a competitor could be customer performs the function in-house. Or an indirect competitor could be customer makes a decision not to buy any software at all. Okay, and those are those entrenched competitors that are hard to unsee. Okay, what we have in the body of the matrix then are the customer's perceptions. To what extent does your company provide a scalable solution? And even when customers don't know, they have perceptions. And so these perceptions, again, may not be based in anything that you think is objective reality, but at this point, that doesn't matter because this is what's affecting their decision. And this company came to me and they said, our salespeople are giving presentations all the time, but we're not getting any contracts. And our salespeople always are emphasizing what we're best at. We're best at scalability and security. We kill our competitors on that. And you can see that in the data here, is that right? And I said, well, why is it that your salespeople seem to be overlooking the critical barrier why your customers aren't buying, which is ease of use? And they said, because our product is actually easier to use than our competitors. I said, well, the fact is, your customers don't believe that. And you can't ignore what your customer's major barrier is. If the customer's major barrier is ease of use, and that, in fact, is the second most important decision criteria, you have to figure out how do you change that perception. And perceptions are malleable. This is where effective marketing comes in. 
When the salesperson goes in, don't give a presentation. Give a little test drive. Have them set up at computers. Allow them to actually experience the ease of use of your software. Don't give a presentation. Let them experience it. Can you have some sort of a testimonial on your website that shows how a customer deployed this technology and how easy it was for their people to use it? Can you have a video demonstration? Uh, there's lots of easy, easy video demonstrations on YouTube, for example. I love some of the YouTube uh, videos that essentially say, you know, Google Docs in plain English. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen these in plain English videos, but essentially you can change this perception of ease of use by changing the way your salespeople are giving this presentation. Change it into more of a demonstration. However, if your product is truly complex from a user's perspective, then you have some redesigning and re-engineering to do. So you can't change the perception if, in fact, the product is hard to use. And it could be that your software people think it's easy to use because, after all, they developed it, right? <laughs> so we might have a problem here. I just hate it when software companies say, oh, our software is so easy to use, it's intuitive, which means if you can't use it, you are truly a dummy, okay? <laughs> Uh, that's a problem. The best way to kill a bad product is to market it. So if your product has defects, you must fix the defects. Okay, so I, 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 I should have started with that, not saying, oh, you can change the perception. You can't change the perception if the product is truly flawed. All right? So fix the product and then work on the perception. And I, I guess I have to say, go. Uh, I should start by saying, I presume your products are actually, you know, doing what you're suggesting that they do. And if your products don't perform as promised, then marketing will definitely kill your business. Okay, so you, th that's not a problem marketing can solve. Okay, so in this particular case, they needed to fix the ease of use. And people who say, let's play to our strengths. If your number one barrier to your customers is your weakness, you better fix your weakness first, okay? And I could go into some of the nuances of this, a difference of an on-demand software solution compared to client-server architecture. I mean, there was lots of complications behind this data. But the key point is, can you make a data for your business based on your customers' perceptions of you and your competitors and use that to figure out how you can actually either improve the way that you're positioning your product or to fix problems that your customers perceive as barriers. Is that a key takeaway that you gather here? Okay, good. Uh, only one more technical slide, and then we'll go back to some of the uh, general information. Okay, there are three types of attributes that customers use when they make decisions about your products. And the linear attributes there's only one straight line there. The linear attributes essentially are as you increase that level of attribute, customer satisfaction increases. These are known attributes. So if you're going to be at buy a car, for example, and I'm using just very common examples to make the point, and then you can tailor them to your own industry. We know when we buy a car, we look at things like fuel efficiency, price, warranty, safety records. Those are linear attributes. And as companies make investments in improving the performance of those attributes, Generally, customer satisfaction is linearly related. Now, there's two types of attributes that customers will not articulate, and it is your job to know your customers so well that you know what is not spoken. First of all, we have what are called expected attributes, and look at the way this curve works. This curve essentially says the presence of the attribute does not lead to satisfaction, but the absence of that attribute causes severe dissatisfaction. Hmm. True story, I went to a retailer in Missoula, decided I would buy a very modern coffee table. I had a glass tabletop on a wrought iron stand, and when I said, great, I'll take it, wrote a check, had my pickup in the lot, and said, could you please load it up? And they loaded up the wrought iron. I said, don't forget the glass. And they said, it doesn't come with the glass. Yeah. I said, why would I buy a coffee table with no glass? And they said, you have to turn it over and look at the fine print on the back. This is bad marketing, OK? <laughs> and so it never occurred to me to ask, does the table I'm buying come with a tabletop? Okay? And so these must be attributes. Again, depending on what you sell, customers presume that you know what those must be attributes are. And in the area of technology, customers aren't sophisticated to articulate what they need to be getting. It's your job to know. 
Okay, now that's a silly example, but it was a real example. It was a true example. I didn't make it up. Okay, delight attributes. The absence of the delight attribute does not cause dissatisfaction, but the presence of the attribute delights or wows your customers. They won't ask for this because they don't know that it's possible. What would this be? To me, these are the nice touches that, in my mind, women excel at. <laughs> these are the customer service aspects. These are the cleanliness aspects. These are the details that escape most people. And it's also the bane of our existence. Um, and so what I encourage you to do is think about how you can position your service on these delight attributes because they will give you an edge. And again, working in the world of technology and services, the fact is good tech support and good customer service are not expected. And when you have them, they are a reason for loyalty. Okay? All right, now I'm going to have to whip through some of this other material. <laughs> So I don't get the, uh, the timing. Yes, I've got the timing. OK, more questions to ask. Uh, I, I, I hope I'm really telling you the heart of marketing is understanding customers. And so what you see here are a list of customers that you should be asking. Do you know the answers to these questions? OK, we live in a digital world. So I'm going to switch now to digital for a minute, because many people think technology marketing means using Twitter to market your product. Um, it does not, but I'm going to talk about the digital world here for a minute. <clears throat> Have you actually gone online and typed in the keywords that customers would use to find your service and identified which websites actually come up? And have you gone to those websites, and oh good, I'm seeing lots of people shake their heads that they've done this. Have you gone to those websites and actually looked at the technical source code, which you can do, you can look at the HTML code behind your competitor's websites, to look at what keywords they're using to come up so high in those search engine rankings. You know, this is a project that my students are working on this week in our technology marketing class, because you can't be uh, credible in technology marketing if you don't know some of these technical issues. But the fact is, the web is so useful to helping you understand why your business isn't doing what you want it to do by analyzing, as a customer would, when you type in keywords, what are you going to do? Um, one of my neighbors up the street runs Mile 22 Bags, which is um, marathon memorabilia for your marathons that you run that you want to have fond memories of. And she said, we just can't seem to get our uh, positioning on pay-per-click Google AdWords because people don't know what to search for. I mean, what do you search for? So we've tried all these different experiments, and we've gotten lots of different competitors that come up that have nothing to do with marathon memorabilia. So the fact is, if it's hard to know what search string your customers will use to type in to find your website, sometimes it's hard to succeed in the online environment. But if you know what the search string is that your customers are going to be using, that's really useful information because then you can use that to buy Google AdWords. How many of you are looking at your Google Analytics on a regular basis for your websites? Okay, and how many of you know you should be but you simply don't have time to? Okay, and how many of you don't have a website? Okay, and how many of you don't know what Google Analytics is? <laughs> okay, so you know, it's interesting. There's about 20% for each of those questions, all right? So again, if you want information on this, um, my students and other students at the University of Montana, um, I always tell this generation of students, companies expect you to know this space. So you better do something in that space. And I tell students they should do it as a gift to, develop, to a company in order to develop their own skill set. Mm -hmm. Because in a network economy like we have, it's not just networking saying, hey, how can I use your contacts? It's essentially, what is the skill I have that you'd be willing to pass my name on to other people because you really respect what I can do for you? OK, so and how many of you know what are the common ways customers misspell the search phrase for your industry. Adventure travel, Machu Picchu. When I do this in class, I ask five students how to spell Machu Picchu. They are all wrong. And if you're Brian Morgan with Adventure Travel, he gets more traffic to his website based on his misspelled keywords that he proactively buys 
than the correctly spelled ones, okay? So p computers don't know how to spell, people don't know how to spell, so use that to your advantage. Okay. I'm going to do just a little bit on advertising because most of you are approached on a regular basis to buy ads in local media. Is that true? How do you know what to say yes to and what to say no to? Do you just buy sometimes because they're just so relentless you feel like you better? Okay. Okay, here's the questions that you need to ask. When you run an ad anywhere, radio, TV, online, uh, trade shows, you need to ask, what is my objective? Because you're going to come back and you're going to measure the performance of the ad against that objective. So I was just sitting here talking to Nicole Hagerman, who you're going to be uh, hearing from a little bit later. Um, she is a wealth of inspiration. I said, where are you running your ads for house? It's her um, really nice uh, furniture store downtown here on Higgins Street. And she said, you know, we always run an ad in the Indy. It's $300, and really, I don't know if it's working for me or not, but I really like supporting the local alternative media. So, well, that's, that's a good business. Um, what else could you speak, be spending that $300 on? She said, lots of stuff. And I said, well, if you're going to be running ads, you have to assess what is the awareness level before you ran the ads. This requires some pre-campaign benchmarks. And it doesn't have to be real sophisticated, but you need to know what the awareness levels are. And you need to know what do people think house is. You have to have perceptions about what do you stand for. It's so exciting we have a baby in the audience. <laughs> That's awesome. OK. And then, after you run that ad for a period of weeks or months, uh, the effect of marketing is not instantaneous. There's a buildup over time. And the buildup over time, the length depends on the length of buying cycle for your customers. How often are people going to come in and buy new furniture? How often are people going to come into a grocery store and buy groceries? The buying cycle affects what your time period is for evaluating effectiveness. And if you don't have staying power for the length of your buying cycle with your campaign, you probably shouldn't run it. Because a short-term campaign for a long buying cycle is the same as wasting your money. OK. So uh, there are lots of technical considerations in advertising. But the bottom line is, if you don't know what your objectives are and how you're going to assess effectiveness, you're never going to know if it was worth the money. And you should know that before you spend the money. And the fact is, being trained in marketing helps you with this. OK, uh, the best thoughts in marketing today essentially say there's new ways to market that don't require running ads. Now, I'm not saying not to run ads, because for some businesses, they're absolutely essential, particularly if you're in retail. But the fact is, if you're a service provider, doing some sort of a seminar or a webinar makes you a thought leader with your customers. And doing seminars means that you are the trusted provider. I'm not going to talk about triple bottom line today, but you should be doing something good for your community. If you're doing business in a community that is not thriving, what's happening to your customer base? You have to find a way to be involved in the community. And the fact is, running a business that's environmentally responsible actually lowers your cost of doing business. There's lots of data on that. <clears throat> and with that, I would like to say that I hope that in this quick overview of marketing, I've helped you understand about making the strategic decisions, understanding your customers, and then setting objectives based on that in order to assess how do you want to invest in marketing for your future? It's a very complicated domain. It's not easy. It's not intuitive. It requires good data. It requires staying power. But I think if you focus and prioritize your efforts, you will see responsiveness from your customers to those efforts. And I hope you have a really good workshop through the day. I'm really excited that I get to go back and teach this morning at 9.30, and again at 11, and again at 2. But it means that I'm not going to be able to stay here and participate in the workshop all day. Um, but I'm really excited to have been invited to speak. And I wish you good luck with your businesses. So I've been told I have time for a couple questions. Yes, 
way in the back, and if you'll, oh, hello, Liz, how are you? I'm great. I can actually see you back there. Good. You know, back to the question when Nicole said, I don't know if I'm getting my money's worth. So how do you know if you're getting your money's worth? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here are some common objectives that would be set. So if your goal is simply to inform a new market that you're around, you have to have pre-awareness measures and then post-awareness measures. If your objective is to change people's perceptions that you're actually um, a furniture store and not an interior design service, then you have to measure what were the perceptions of the word house compared to your post-campaign perceptions. If you have a website and you're trying to drive people to your website, that would be a way that you can assess the traffic at your website. Don't have a website just to drive traffic, though. Make sure you know what you want your customers to do there, whether it's sign up to receive an ebook, whether it's to log their name about what they're interested in, whether it's to attend a webinar that you're going to put on. So simply driving traffic for the sake of traffic only works if you actually are in a very narrow niche of the online world. So Liz, my answer to your question is, it really depends on your objectives for running the ad. And if you don't have objectives for running it, you have no way to know if it was effective or not. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, another one way in the back. Yes, do you think it's better to teach your customers or let your customers teach you? OK, is it better to teach your customers or is it better to let your customers teach you? In I, go ahead, sir. In retail. In retail. I think it's a two-way street. Depending on the retail business that you're in, you absolutely need to know what your customers want and to understand their pain points, even if it's a business like Nicole's business where she's selling furniture. Do they understand that the furniture that they buy has implications for the off-gassing in their house of formaldehyde wood from you know furniture products? I'm just making this up. I don't know. I, I think it's, it's reasonable. OK. So I think you have to let your customers teach you, because if they don't know that that's an issue, then you're talking to them on parallel planes that is not communication. And at the same time, you have to be a trusted resource. And if you don't have that trust and credibility to have a dialogue with your customers that they respect, then odds are they're going to go to somebody else to make their purchase decisions. You know, the fact is, I think in retail, a lot of us trust our local retail providers. And then we go to them, we get the information we want, and then we shop online to see if we can find a better deal. OK, this is a really big problem. And so I think you have to have the whole package to keep customers loyal so that they actually buy from you rather than going online to find the next deal. Um, and that's, again, a very complicated answer to how to manage that. But in this case, I think you have to have both sides of that equation, sir. What do you think? You know, I think it's the class of uh, customers you have. I mean, you have, like you said, uh, type of furniture or type of, um, you know, you can have, I mean, you can be a secondhand store or a pawn shop or a, uh, a furniture store or a Walmart or Kmart. You know, some people won't go to Kmart or Walmart. And right. Shop to high-end retail stores. And that gets back to the strategy sweet spot, in my opinion. The people who are going to be attracted to those types of stores or a different type of customers, they're looking for a different type of value. And so that's going to require a different type of this dialogue between letting them teach you compared to you teaching them. So it all starts with that strategy sweet spot, I think, those differences. One more question, and then we're done. Yes? Um, just um, we're in the service industry and talking about real estate development for instance. For instance, when you look at your competitors and you say as a for sale by owner or an online service, etc., from a national level, I find it real interesting when the consumers come to you, over 70 or 80 percent of them have already been online shopping, yes. educating themselves, yes. and they come to you or in a local market and say, listen, that home is overpriced $30,000 and we're looking at a national average mm -hmm. and when you want to create that trust level with your clients and they're saying no 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 the question he asked back there is real interesting because it's your clients feel more empowered mm -hmm. coming to you now and the sorry. sorry and the question then becomes who's educating who yeah but 
Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I think when you say, do I have any thoughts about that, it boils down to when your customers are using the Internet and they come to you with what they think is accurate information that actually doesn't apply to the particular situation that you're in. Again, this is a really, this is where the Internet is not your friend. And in this particular case, I think you have to have sufficient information so that you're just providing them information because it's really hard to tell the customers that they're wrong because, again, their perceptions are their starting point. But somehow you have to convey information that actually helps change those perceptions and move them to understand the differences between the national market and the local market. And it's really time consuming to have this dialogue. Um, but it is the world that we live in. And I also think that by putting on these seminars or local workshops or having other ways to convey information, that ultimately that credibility helps you have that dialogue where they understand that you're not just uh, marketing to them with your ulterior motives in mind, that you actually have expertise that is the foundation of why you're doing what you're doing. I thank you all very much, and I wish you a, a good day. I would ask that uh, Amy and Christine and Margaret and Nicole come up lower. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Moore. Dr. Moore, Doctor, thank you very, very much uh, for your words of wisdom. We very, very much appreciate uh, your expertise uh, in, uh, well, for small businesses across the board. Uh, now we're going to start uh, the first of two panel discussions that we're going to have this morning. Uh, the first is called uh, Made in Montana Success Stories, and uh, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce them. I'll introduce them uh, individually before they speak. Our first uh, panelist is uh, Amy McQuilkin. Amy is the owner of Betty's Divine here in Missoula. Uh, Betty's Divine is a clothing boutique on Higgins Avenue downtown. And uh, one of the things that I especially like about uh, Amy is that uh, she offers a 50% off an item of clothing if her customers vote. And so that's a <laughs> very good thing. So uh, we'll start with you, Amy. Go ahead. I'm glad you like that. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I feel like it's going to be hard to not talk about marketing after all that great information um, from Dr. Moore. So thank you. Um, so I've, uh, I opened Betty's Divine seven years ago, and prior to that, um, about 10 years ago, I decided to go to MCDC, Montana Community Development Corporation, and eva evaluate this wonderful business idea that I just popped into my head. I had been out of college just a few years, came here to the university, studied psychology and women's studies. I decided that I wanted to stay in Missoula and raise my family here and just become part of the community. My idea was shot down. It wasn't very good. Didn't have good experience. Didn't really understand the market and what was needed. You know, just had this idea. I wanted to sell shoes. But I listened to the lovely folks at MCDC and I continued managing a boutique I was working at at the time. and making payments on my house and having children. <laughs> um, and then about seven years ago, I went back to them with an even better idea, I thought. And this time, they, they gave me the thumbs up. And um, that, first of all, having that option of you know a service, Montana Community Development Corporation, who I believe are here today, somebody who knows business, knows Missoula, to go to and say, look, you know, you're not my friend, you're not my husband, who's going to say, yeah, do it. Um, you're an expert, and what do you think about this? And they put me through the ringer, you know, I, ha I had to lay everything out, I had to really work. I had never taken a business course in my life, it was not what I studied in school. Um, but without them, without the recommendations they made, the suggestions, the research that they had me do, the focus groups, I don't think my business would be where it is today. Um, again, we're in our seventh year of business, and from the get-go, we 
opened up with a boom and kept on going. Um, and it's because of that networking, that listening to what they offered. Um, when they had a business class, you know, I hopped on it, even though it was very time consuming. <laughs> I was there. And that kind of networking has blossomed in me. It's, you know, caused me to reach out to my neighbors in the hip strip where my store is just south of the river and to um, work together, to throw around ideas, to work on different types of marketing. And uh, that is a, a big part, again, of why my business is su successful, networking. You can't look at your competitors as your as your competitors. You know, if we all if we work together to promote a, a vibrant community, we have more people to come in and shop at our stores. We have more reasons for people to come to our downtown area. And so that was a big step for me, looking at even my direct competitors as as people who could help me and I could help them. Um, another another big thing that I just wanted to bring up about this workshop, being women in business, is it's really I, I, a big part of why I went into business is because I wanted to find balance with being a mother and being a successful businesswoman. And as an entrepreneur, I believe that's a way that we as women can really balance that part of our lives. It's it's hard. We're, I mean, we're in this day and age. We're expected to have careers and to be, you know, these great, wonderful, their mothers. And as entrepreneurs, you can do that. And another a, a way that you can do that is to be able to delegate. You have to put together a really good team. Somebody who's here today actually recently told me this. She was referring to a computer program, but she said, if it can't work alone, if it has to have you to work, it's no good. And even though, I mean, if, if those of you who know my business, like I am my business, you know, it's a reflection of me, I'm there, um, I buy the clothing, it, it's me, but it run, it can run alone. I, I give the confidence and the skills to my employees and my manager and the team that I put together for marketing and for um, art direction and, and building that team leads leads my business to success and it allows me to also be a good mother. All right, I think that's about it. Well, thanks, Amy. Appreciate it. Uh, next we have uh, Christine Littig. Christine, uh, when I was at the TV station this morning, they were running a, a, a piece on you. So it's good to have you here. She's the owner of Furnaces Bakery uh, here in Missoula. Uh, she has, Christine has a number of successful restaurants under her belt, and uh, uh, Bernice's has been voted Missoula's best bakery for five years running. So, uh, wow. Congratulations. <laughs> Um, I just want to say thank you for coming today and thank you to the tester office for asking me to be here. Um, there are a lot of times upon self-reflection that I don't actually see myself as a successful businesswoman. Um, it seems like it's this new place that I have journeyed to um, and yet I still am so intrinsically competitive and hands-on in my business that I just don't self-reflect in that way. So I feel very complimented. Um, I also just want to say that I think the tester office works very hard. And Senator Tester, thank you so much, really. Um, I'm also excited to hear this panel and was... Uh, just for the record, Christine, that's because I have mostly women on my staff. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I don't disagree with what Jackie said earlier. We definitely bring a different perspective and a highlight to detail. And that can be our nemesis as well. And as a woman in business, I'm just wondering today, how many people here are actually in the startup phase? Oh, quite a few. And then are the other half currently in business? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so today in thinking about the workshop, I thought we were focusing most on startup, but I'll just uh, kind of dig into what I had to say. Um, 
I am excited to be here and to be part of this panel and to even hear Jackie briefly this morning um, because I work as a constant student and I would encourage each and every one of you, no matter what phase you are in in your business and no matter where you at, are at, you need to see yourself as a constant student of the industry that you have chosen. And if you aren't passionate about it, well, throw in the towel now. Uh, there is still some kind of a crazy misperception that if you own your own business, your feet are up in the back and you're drinking champagne. And I'm here to tell you that that's really not it. And there, Bernice's is 34 years strong. And by the way, it's had three female business owners. I am the third. And 34 years, and I'm not sitting in the back with my feet up. Never, not a day. And that's the part that actually inspires me, too. But I want to encourage you to be a student. And some of those examples are years ago, before I ever even knew I was going to go into this industry, I was already a student of this industry. I was living in New York City, pursuing an acting career. And why, I have no idea, but casually on the side, I was taking management courses at the community school in New York. In what? I don't know. I should have known then. Or when I showed up in, back in Missoula and wanted to create myself as a restaurateur business owner in Missoula, I was going around and dining in other restaurants and sitting there with my notebook <laughs> watching. What are they doing? Why did he do that? Where are they going? Where's that located? Oh. And you know, Mike Muncie and Ed Wells are great friends of mine. And I sat in their restaurant for months watching what they did and learning from them and you know, garnering their respect but also garnering their knowledge and trying to learn why they were making those choices. You know, be a student by going on industry trips right now. Any vacation. I, I mean, I eat it, you know, anywhere from, don't let me, Amy and I are friends, so we're going to giggle at each other all day, but, I, you know, anywhere from a dozen to 15 bakeries every time I go. doesn't matter where I go. Um, and I don't even like baking. <laughs> I'm not a baker. I don't know if you know that about me. Um, so everywhere I go, I'm looking to see what other people are doing. Why are they making the choices they're making? And I introduce myself. Um, you know, some people say, I can't believe you do what you do, and it's so risky, and why did you decide to become a business owner? Boy, I just look at it, I'm only here once. I want to meet every person I can meet. I want to find out what people are thinking. I want to journey through life with that element of discovery and intrigue, and, and like I say, be a student. And so the last piece that I think in communicating that uh, first message today is that I think a lot of us, whether we want to admit it or not, we all surf a bit. We go home and we surf on the net and even if you're like me and you really don't want to, I'm just I'm curious as to why everyone's on it. For me, I'm just like, why are we you know, why is my daughter begging me for time in front of this screen? But what I've learned for myself now is I'm translating that into doing what I do better. And I would encourage each of you in part of your student process to garner twenty minutes a night, ten an hour, whatever you think you can give, to start self-evaluating yourself as a business person on the net. Some of the really fun sites to explore are Entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, Entrepreneur Magazine has an incredible website and great videos. I mean, last night, just kind of prepping myself and get myself in the mood, I watched uh, the gal who started Spanx. Wow, she's a great public speaker. And there's two great videos on her journey on to how she ended up into business. And also, Inc. is also a really great site. And so while I don't enjoy being on the internet, and I, I thoroughly don't enjoy having that screen in front of me, um, I'm trying to educate myself, continue to be a student, be wise, use my time wisely, let my daughters see me on that screen being a student, being vibrant, um, in addition to, you know, watching my favorite nighttime drama or whatever, you know, happens to be floating around. Um, take classes, get to know your peers. I know a lot of people talk about it as networking. To me, it's community staying really active and getting to know people, their perspective, what it is they want, not just from my business, but boy, can I learn more about what I can do in my business when I hear about people talking about what they want from some other company, whether it's computers or shoes or you know, interior decor. All of those elements directly reflect what I do at Bernice's. And lastly, I would say, you better have a good few old-fashioned hardback paperback books near your bedside. 
Mine has about seven right now. <laughs> always be reading, always be searching, and I think it will help you be extremely successful in this industry. But moving on, I would say today too, the other piece I'd like to pass on to you is be sure you're developing your kitchen cabinet. At least that's what I call it. I think everyone has different terms for that. But who are your go-tos when you're down in the dumps? Who are your go-tos when your numbers start falling even after you've crunched for six months and you feel like you know what you're doing? Who do you go to when your marketing seems to have become stagnant? Who do you trust to give you the honest response? Amy referred to MCDC as helping her grow and, and doing the hard work. You're going to need that kitchen cabinet if you plan on continuing in this industry, any industry, in business for a period of time. You're going to need to be able to go to professionals and have a kitchen cabinet of peers, coworkers, could be an employee who's just incredibly honest with whom perspective you trust, and use them as a resource. Um, I love my kitchen cabinet, and my very first element in my kitchen cabinet is my husband. He does run my business with me, and I am excited by the fact that the two of us look at business so differently. And I can get wound up in the details, which as I say, as a woman, it can be a deficit, and he will just broaden my scope and let me see the forest through the trees and open my eyes and be able to talk to me about business in a way where we've learned to separate the personal when we're at work and it's a really successful piece for how we both operate and how we use each other in success. Um, the third piece that I'll throw out here and I, I don't want to I want to hit 10 minutes and I want lots of time for Q&A but is for those of you that are starting, a business plan is essential. And there isn't anywhere you can go online or in any bookstore or down to the MCDC office. You must do that work. And I want to say to you that while I love what I do, I love starting a business. <laughs> That's the fun part. So if you're looking at those numbers and, and, and you're just not getting it or the marketing aspect or who are my customers and how do I narrow it down, Please hear me now, that is the fun part. The job begins when your business is 34 years old and you manage 35 people 24 hours a day, producing a fresh product every day, over 300 products, and you don't want that staff to go anywhere. <laughs> That's the job. You want to Stay on top. I mean, I feel very lucky. I've had some successful businesses of my own, and for those of you that don't know, I started Redbird Restaurant downtown, um, and I'm a chef by trade, and sold that restaurant, and I'm extremely proud that it's still going and is, you know, a top restaurant in Montana. But I know now that it's not just the startup, that I am now in a job in a bakery that's been here for 34 years, and every single day I strive to continue to be competitively great. And while I have the job of retaining my staff, and the job of figuring out how to pay the bills, and the job of sitting down and talking with my staff and evaluating their performance, the part that I have to keep using for myself is, okay, I need to re-inspire, I need to stay competitively great. And for those of you that are just starting, enjoy the startup. It, it is fun. You're taking your creative ideas that you've been sitting on, like Amy was talking about, and you're turning them into reality. You're spinning them into something that could be your life for an extended period of time. And it's absolutely the most fun part. The sustaining of your business is the job, it's the work. And then you have to find that piece that keeps you competitively great and on your edge. And I'll just say right now, I'm excited today and have been for the past seven days because Bernice's is making a new style of wedding cake. <laughs> and so we are staying competitively great because we are getting so many requests for fondant cakes, which we don't want to do because the fondant gets peeled off and thrown away, and we are a sustainably-minded business. But we have just figured out how to architecturally and technically make what are popular, those topsy-turvy cakes, um, not using fondant, using buttercream. And we put one out this weekend that we were all so happy, and we're beaming from ear to ear, and 
couldn't be more excited. So the last piece I want to say is, as you're a student, as you're doing your business plan, as you're focusing on what your mission, your marketing, all of those elements are, you know, find a way to stay inspired, stay passionate, and stay competitively great. Thank you, buttercream, huh? Yeah. Makes me want to get married again. To the same woman, of course. Uh, our next panelist is Margaret Burns. Va Margaret uh, has got a great story. She's the owner of Big Sky Yoga Retreat in Bozeman. Uh, it is a story about uh, why we all live here, why Montana is a draw. Uh, because Margaret packed her business up that was in Washington, D.C., and uh, moved her life here to open a, a yoga retreat center in Bozeman. So it's great to have you here, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you. I am very happy to be here. Normally when I get in front of a crowd to speak, I'm teaching yoga. So did you all know that was on the agenda this morning? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, how many of you do yoga? OK, quite a few. So you'll know what I'm talking about when I throw out those terms. Um, I had a career in corporate America before I discovered yoga. I used to work for L'Oreal, so a cosmetics uh, company um, did product development for them. And it was a dream job in many ways, but in many other ways it was not. It was all about this life balance that we're talking about. Um, how do we achieve that? And for me, sitting around um, coming up with names for lipsticks was not really going to balance my life. It, it was fun, but I didn't see that as a long-term project. And was very drawn, this was when I, I lived in New York City, I was very drawn to the practice of yoga, and it helped me balance things, it helped me balance this stressful corporate career and a new marriage and lots of other things, and um, you know, it was doing something for me. So I had a series of personal events um, all come together in the same year as 9-11, um, made me question a lot of different things, and I quit this job and opened a yoga studio. So sort of went in a completely different direction. Uh, I had thought all along I would never start my own business. I wanted to make my mistakes at someone else's expense um, and never viewed myself as an entrepreneur. Well, you know, it, now um, working for myself, I can't imagine anything else. So it was really a, a, a change in course for me. Um, I had to figure a lot of things out on my own, but it, it really worked um, well. I didn't know what I was doing, and I think that was uh, you know, an advantage in some ways. So uh, I opened a yoga studio in Washington, D.C., and that was 10 years ago, actually. Um, and about five years into that, my husband is from Missoula, and uh, his family is here. We had often been out in Montana and came out here to ski. Um, and visit family and had always, ta always talked about having retreats out here and it just never happened in the day-to-day -day business that I was doing back in Washington with my studio. Um, well, we got an opportunity to move to, about, to Bozeman in 2007 and I thought, well, what am I going to do now? You know, I, I started this studio and it was so wonderful and I had this great community in D.C. and, you know, that was where I wanted to stay and on and on and on. We had our daughter there um, and then I started thinking about the lifestyle here in Montana and how I felt when I came out here, um, how it changed my perspective when I would go back to the big city. Even I thought myself, um, you know, a city girl and kind of had that identity and I had to struggle with that a bit. Well, we moved out here and, um, you know, now you couldn't drag me away kicking and screaming. So, um, and now I bring people out here to, you know, get that feeling and take it home with them. So, um, my, my business is a yoga retreat business and we combine it with other things that people love to do in Montana, skiing, hiking, horseback riding. We do retreats in, uh, called Cowgirl Yoga where we combine horseback riding with, with um, the yoga. And um, we have uh, part of this, uh, what I do, we give back. Um, we have a program called Cowgirls Against Cancer. We bring can breast cancer um, survivors out on retreat to experience you know, this healing with horses and yoga. So that's a little bit about what I do. Um, what I want to talk more about is sort of how I got there um, and how I, how I stay on top of that. Um, I think when you're starting your own business, you're going to start small and you have to start small but think big and that is is I think looking back that's what really pushed me along. You're going to grow. It's inevitable. You're going to grow. That will happen organically. Um, but thinking big along the way can really help. So one of the things that um, I did was I targeted uh, bigger companies that I thought uh, fit really well with what I did, what I was offering. 
and the, you know, the, there's a whole spectrum to that. I think part of that is also partnering with local businesses, which is what um, these ladies were talking about as well. So how do you create synergy? Synergy is my big word. Um, how do you find other other businesses, other people that support what you do, that that have syner synergistic um, ties to what you're doing? So uh, there's a women's athletic apparel company out of uh, California. It's called Athleta, and some of you may get the catalog in the mail. Um, they were my long shot. I was targeting different companies, and I wrote them an email and somehow got through to someone and um, told them my story. And uh, they ended up coming out to Bozeman before I even launched my business and um, shooting a catalog in Big Sky and, and featuring me in the catalog. And um, basically, that launched my business. I would have never expected that anyone would have called me back. And you know, was just trying all kinds of different things. So you know, think big and, and don't be afraid. Don't talk yourself out of it before you even try it, because you don't know what's going to happen. Um, so that was one of you know the lessons I learned from that. Just try anything, because some of these really crazy things that someone might tell you no, it's never going to work. It, it might be your big break. Um, I'm. Talking about synergy, okay, and, and partnering with local businesses. So for me, you know, I started on my own, and I have a little different business from from these ladies. It's it's service oriented. Um, I was the product. I was teaching the yoga classes. I was putting together the retreats. But as things went on, I started um, looking for other people that, you know. Um, supported what I did. So I needed someone to cook the meals. And I found a wonderful local chef who uh, has a, f a small farm. And she you know, emphasizes sustainable cooking. So she cooks on, all our, on our retreats. And she talks about what she does. People are very interested in taking that home. Um, I work with a, photo a local photographer in Bozeman. You know, so if you were had a started a business in a bigger city, you'd probably have to pay thousands of dollars for a photographer to take pictures. Um, you know, I worked with him. I uh, came to him with some crazy ideas. I had an idea to do an ad for my retreats. Um, I didn't have $15,000 to run a full page ad in Yoga Journal. Um, had this vision in my mind, a picture of my daughter who's actually sitting right here, and I on horseback with yoga mats tied to the back of the saddle. And I went to this photographer <laughs> with this idea. So what do you think? I can't pay you um, very much, but maybe this I have this idea, maybe it could be a national ad. Well, it, it was picked up by a yoga mat manufacturer, ran twice in Yoga Journal, was one of the best uh, received ads that they had. So, you know, these little stories, um, they sound great, right? But, you know, at one point it was just something in the back of my mind. So use use those ideas, write them down and, and follow up on them. See if you can, you know, find a way to make them happen. So um, what I want to share with you is three tips that are top of my list and, and sort of where three things that have really helped me with my business. Um, doing it yourself, okay, is, is sort of my big motto. And you have to have the support and the synergy with other businesses and other people. But there's a lot of things you can do to push your business along. The first thing that I would recommend is to do your own website. And I know that sounds that can sound intimidating and technical. Uh, it's not. Um, there are so many ways that you can do your own site and not have to know HTML. Um, I, that was one of the first things I did when I started my yoga studio in Washington, D.C., was I learned how to do this software. Luckily, I have a husband who's a, you know, a tech guy, and he helped me with that. But I learned as I was doing it. And um, I'm going through that process again, because you know they're always upgrading this darn software. So, um, But I have control of what I'm putting out there. And I feel it's a, it's a reflection of me and my business. It's a personal thing. And my husband would always ask me, why are you spending so much time on this website? Because it's a reflection of what I, how I want people to see what I'm offering. So you know, find a way to do your own website. And yes, it might start really small, but then it becomes big. I, you know, I spent all this time on creating this story online, and people would come into my studio in DC and they'd say, "I thought this was going to be some huge yoga studio with 100 people in class. It was, you know, um, 600 square feet." So create this presence with your website. You have control of that, and and it feels good to have that control. So that's one thing. Um, you know, uh, Jackie was talking about. Um, advertising and I know that it's it's part of the game right but um, I don't advertise I again I didn't have 
the money to run an ad in Yoga Journal, the budget. So I found another way to get that in there. Um, I pursue editorial. I've pursued that editorial since I started the business. That was where I started with this uh, women's apparel company I, I mentioned earlier. I thought I'd pursue the editorial. Um, if you are advertising, you know that's fine, but make that also part of your strategy. You don't know when you're going to get through to a national magazine. Um, it might seem like an unrealistic goal. It's not. It's not. And if you keep at it, even if you get a no, um, we're not interested, or, or you know, most of the time there's a lack of response from some of these uh, press people. You never know when they're going to call you down the line. So it's all cumulative. I get people calling me for quotes on the darndest things. How will um, yoga help a rodeo a bull rider? That was the most recent thing. So, you know, well, I'd, I'd love to give you a quote on that. So because we work with yoga and horseback riding. So it, it's cumulative. Pursue the editorial. It, I think it's a very, very effective way to get your your name out there. Um, you know, so research. We're talking about researching what supports your business, what publications um, you know, would, would be synergistic to what you're doing. Um, and it's interesting, we haven't talked about Facebook yet, okay? So how many of you are on Facebook? Yeah. Um, you know, make a business page for your business. Uh, they enable you to do that now. So that's different from friending someone. You become a fan of a business on Facebook. Um, during 2009, right after I started my business, and I thought that um, you know this was going to be tough sell, getting people to come out to Montana on retreat, I filled the whole retreat from a Facebook ad. Okay, you can monitor that because you can see how many clicks you're getting. Um, it's not you know intangible. So create a Facebook page. Um, you know, invite people to become fans of your business. Business, it's it's a really incredible tool and it's very easy you can put up pictures you can put up things on a daily basis um, you know, on my Facebook page I put up all kinds of things tying to Montana tourism in Montana there's all kinds of sites on Yellowstone on Glacier um, different businesses in, in Bozeman where I live and uh, you know always putting links to their websites on Facebook so that people can find out about this stuff um, you know, it's just an, an incredible tool. It's different from sending an email where somebody feels like you're spamming them. It's just a little, you know, daily update. They get it on their page, and it's all about you and what you want to highlight in a very, very digestible soundbite. Um, so those are those are my three top tips for no matter where you are in the entrepreneurial cycle. Um, and I hope that uh, I hope that those will resonate with you. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, next, we have Nicole Hagerin Miller. Nicole is the owner of the House Design Studio here in Missoula. Uh, she's also the managing director of the World Trade Center here on campus in Montana World Trade Center. And uh, she's, her small business sells sustainable graphic furniture, home decor, and gifts. And she's also co chair of the Montana Academy of Distinguished Entrepreneurs. So, Nicole? Thank you. Um, and thanks again to center staff for putting this event on today. I think this is wonderful. When I'm asked to speak about um, business in Montana, one of the things I'm most excited about is the access to resources that we have here. We have an incredible amount of resources at our fingertips. And I think one of the biggest uh, challenges is that as, as women, as small business owners, we don't even know that they exist. So I hope today, if anything, you take away from this is that how many people in this community, in this state, are here to support you as entrepreneurs? I think if you were in any other state, I don't think we'd have the access that we do. So if anything, please take advantage of, of the resources we have. Um, I guess I, when, when I was approached to speak on this panel, I said, you know, is there anything that I can narrow in on or, or what, what would be the best thing for me to talk about? And, and the center staff said, you know, simply share your feedback on, on your experiences. So I thought I would kind of give you a little bit of background on me and then kind of give you my, my, my six tips that I think are, that have helped me along the way. Um, I moved back to Missoula uh, 2007. I was at an online retailer in Salt Lake City called Overstock.com. And it was through this company that I had a wonderful opportunity to actually develop our global supply chain. So I spent the majority of my time trying to shorten the um, process between the manufacturer and the customer. So I spent a lot of my time in, in overseas, mostly in, in um, China and India. I set up an office in Shanghai. 
So I had this great perspective of everything that was out there and, and entrepreneurs all over the world and these small manufacturers that now we as a company were going to seek out and try to find products from. And one of the things that always impressed me was, you know, here we were this, you know, $800 million company and we were buying products from these tiny little suppliers from all over the world that were selling out of um, storage units or, or whatever it may be. And I thought, this is amazing that these small businesses can supply this big company and we have direct access to them. So when I moved back to Montana, it was really, um, for me, it was, I think, being an entrepreneur, being a serial entrepreneur. I, women, I think, naturally are entrepreneurs. They I think it's 83% of consumer products are purchased by women. So we're out in the market every day. And if there's not something we need, we know it. And we see a void. And when I came back to Montana, that was, or Missoula in particular, that was what I noticed is I was trying to refurnish my home. And I couldn't find the things I wanted. I leaned more towards contemporary design. That was kind of my style. And I, I couldn't find anything. And then when I did find something, because of my background in manufacturing, I knew the cost. And the cost was like 300% markup, and I thought, this is ridiculous. People in Missoula should not have to pay this, even if they do find something. So that was, for me, I knew how to fill. It wasn't that my dream was to always open this small retail store. It was that I was an entrepreneur, and I knew how to fill this void in the market. And so I pursued that, and it took me a long time. Um, I have a business partner, and we worked on our business plan for a long time, I think two years kind of in the making so that we could get it right. And we, I'm a little bit different circumstance where um, my business is kind of my hobby and as an entrepreneur, of course, you have a hobby as a business. But um, so I work on my business at night, in the morning, on the weekends. So I don't get to see the, the growth as rapid as I like to. So I have to be patient with myself. But, um, but I think, I. I think um, when you're when you identify that opportunity, that's when you have to say, "I'm going to go after it." So my first tip is is to develop a business plan. I think you've heard it from from numerous people here today, and I think it's an overwhelming task that you that you start with, but it's something you have to do. But I I quickly follow that up with, "Don't get caught in the weeds." There's so many great um, business plan templates. Uh, Score.org is a great website that has numerous templates and financial statements. And you do have to spend the time going through this. But I think people kind of get caught up in some of the minute details that the second you open the door, it's going to change. So you have to be careful not to get caught in the weeds and have to kind of keep focused that you want to develop a business plan to have it. Because this, whoever you're going to talk to, that's the first thing they're going to ask for is a business plan. So you have to have something. And I say when you're developing your business plan, spend 60 to 70% of your time on your cash flow statement. That is the most important thing, because at the end of the day, you have to make money. And a bank is going to want to see that you can make money. I think at when House, when we were developing the business plan for that, we were surprised to learn how much inventory it would take to turn the revenue that we needed to earn the money that we wanted. And we didn't want to take on more debt. So we that, we had to get kind of creative of, okay, how are we going to make this money? So going through that process and spending your time on the cash flow statement is something I strongly, strongly encourage. Um, let's see. Oh, and it's a tool that someone gave me, a recommendation that someone gave me that I always follow. And this is on some financial templates, but it's not on others. And that's to look at things as a percentage of a total. So for example, um, your marketing dollars, so your total marketing budget, do you spend 10% on Google AdWords or do you spend 100%? And just knowing that percent is, is great because you can it helps you quickly identify buckets, first of all, that could have holes in the bottom of them, but also it helps you to benchmark against other industries and easily talk to other people say, hey, I spend 10% of my marketing on, on Google AdWords. What do you spend? Does that work for you? It easily allows you to talk to other business owners um, without giving away you know, proprietary information on, on your marketing spend. One thing that, that I would encourage you to do is when you are designing or, or thinking about a business is to identify what it is you want from this business? Is it life balance? Is it to replace or supplement income? Is it to turn a hobby into an interest? I think if you know the answer to this going in, 
you have a much better strategic approach to your business and you know what you're trying to achieve. I think sometimes people get into business thinking they're going to have life balance and they don't. Starting a business, I think sometimes doesn't give you balance. <laughs> so there's so many moving parts to operating a business. It, to try to think that you are going to be able to do all of those is insane. You're not going to be able to. And so I think to hit on some other points, you really have to identify what it is that you're good at and then be able and allow yourself to outsource other things and to work with other people to kind of supplement that. So those are kind of two recommendations, but I think the first part is that part of that is to know what you want from the business and the second part is to know what your strengths are in that business. And I would keep a list of those strengths and, and weaknesses when you're talking to people like MCDC, like the Small Business Development Center, because what's fascinating is that there's resources to help you with that. So if you hate accounting, you absolutely know that that's not your strength. Well, it just so happens that there may be a learning grant to help someone on your team be able to understand QuickBooks. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind when you're when you're going through the process of developing your business plan and working with service providers, because oftentimes they can help you with those weaknesses. Um, <laughs> one thing I um, would say, I think, from my personal experience is that to, to accept and recognize that you will always be spread thin, there will never be enough time to do everything that you want to do. And I think it, the sooner you accept that, the sooner <laughs> I think you'll be able to overcome that. Um, and that comes back to having a great team and great people to support you, is you have to be able to allocate what, um, what you want to do, all those things that are on your wish list, all those Facebook promos that you want to do, and, and all the different um, ideas that you have. You have to be able to have a team that can support you and, and implement that. Um, a great example, and I even see this at the World Trade Center, companies that are successfully domestically and now they're going into global markets. I've seen companies who say, okay, I'm ready to go into Brazil. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start exporting into this market. Great. They come on a trade mission. They come back. And then I call them two weeks later. I said, so how's that deal going? You know, we, we work really hard to, to kind of tee up these contracts and get people in front of them. They said, oh, I haven't really followed up. Why haven't you thought of, oh, I just, I haven't had time, I've been busy. I'm like, okay, well, you know, it's kind of important. Relationships are the key to international business. I suggest you follow up really soon. Okay, okay, I will. Another week goes by, I call. Oh, I just haven't got to that. I've got this other thing going on. And so in the back of my mind, I'm going, okay, you've just spent eight, what, eight to $10,000 to go on this trade mission, and now you're just a little too busy to follow up on this. So you have to, I think, have that strategy in place for, okay, I'm going to go into this international market. I've got to have the resources to support that, and I've got to be committed to that. If I can't do that, I've got to know that I've got the money and time and energy for somebody else to do that. So, so it happens on all levels, not just the startup, but even as you're growing. So I think it's in kind of important to, to kind of check that. Um, another example of that is social media. I think social media as a small business owner is so overwhelming for me because there are so many different social media platforms, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, you know, it's like you have to constantly stay on top of all these things. And so you, it's and knowing what you want to achieve from these social media platforms is the best way to go into them because you could spend all your time and energy trying to navigate these systems or just the functionality within one alone I think is overwhelming. So um, that's another great example of you can spread yourself too thin so know exactly what it is you want to achieve and or assign someone who, who's really good at that to be able to manage that for you. Another um, recommendation that I would have is, is be really judicious when you're selecting your software management program for your business. And maybe you're saying, I don't need a software management program. Well, that's the farthest from the truth because if you remember what Jackie was saying, everything is data and everything is analytics now. Everything is. So whether you are you know, selling tea towels that you make or whether you're selling sophisticated software, you need some way of tracking how much your raw material costs, how much you're selling, how much um, your whatever it may be. I mean, you, you, the analytics that you have is what makes you 
allows you to make smart decisions when you move forward. Um, and the other thing about choosing a software management system is to know how it integrates with your other systems. A great example at House, we, but we, um, we run on Mac at, at the store, and so we've got this really amazing software program that I'm pretty sure I use only about 50% of the capacity of the system. But we didn't do the diligence up front to know when we were setting it up how it actually talked to QuickBooks. Hmm, small detail, right? So after a year into our business, we had to go back and start thinking about, okay, now we've got to get this plugged in. But that was a small detail that someone, I mean, you just you don't think of, right? You're just trying to get things going and get things on the door. So, um, so be very judicious about the software management system that you choose and do your research. Talk to other people in, in your industry. What do they use? What do they like? What do they not like about that system? Um, and then my final tip is, even as you're starting your business, write your exit strategy. I think the second you plan your exit strategy, the second is you, you start managing your business as if you're going to sell it. And that's surprisingly when you'll start to see um, the revenue and other examples will start to follow in terms of um, you know what defines a, a successful business. And I mean at the, at the same time, then when you do start to grow and you do start to get approached by people, you have a sense of what your business valuation is and what what you want to negotiate as as your um, as your strategy for for moving on to something new. Um, so I hope that those few tips are, are helpful as you go on and, and launch your business or continue and, and grow your business. Um, and thanks again. Thanks, Nicole. Um, and, and thanks to all the panelists. I think we've got time for, uh, for a few questions here in uh, five minutes or so. Um, right in the back. My question is for Nicole. What was that Mac system that you were talking about? Oh, the system that I use is called Lightspeed. It's a point of sale system. And I have a love-hate relationship with it, so <laughs> does it integrate with QuickBooks? It does. Oh, thank you. If you set it up in the beginning. <laughs> Other questions? Right here in the front, middle of the panel. Um, I have been to a couple of workshops in just the last few months. Um, our, my business, I'm a beekeeper, but then associated with that is the products that I make from honey and wax and then also the sale of raw local honey. And it's a family business. I have two small kids. Um, I'm involved in my community quite a bit, and so I'm already spread quite thin. And our business is uh, fairly small. And what I'm wondering is if I'm naive in thinking that I can make this work all on my own. I've heard everybody talk about their team or outsourcing, and I've thought about how great these things would be, but I simply cannot afford them, nor, do, nor can I afford to go into more debt um, because of the initial cost of starting up our business. So I'm wondering if there's a way to scale it so I, I or a way to figure out what my scale should be, you know, and what, am I the only person that I can, you know, answer this question is, you know, can I do this all by myself? Is it possible? Like, coming, asking women who have been in business and have been successful, is it possible to do it? Go ahead, Margaret. Um, I was just going to respond to this because I feel pretty much that I'm a one-woman show and um, I don't have a team and it's been really hard for me to actually let go of control and give anyone else anything to do. Um, although I understand the concept of delegating, I, I think that um, just from what you're saying with your business, um, you could get people involved perhaps without paying them. Could you trade them um, some of your wonderful products? Um, it, it sounds like something like, I would want to work for you. I would want to be involved in your beekeeping business. And that, that's what I have is people want to be involved in the other business. They think it's great. And they're willing to come do things for me on their own time just to be part of that. Could you pursue that a little bit? Um, I don't have employees. I have independent contractors. So you know that's a different setup and that requires money to pay them but it's still 
you know, you can control it. Um, I just hired someone, uh, a young woman, to help me with PR outreach. I have all the, the things in place, all the contacts. I don't have the time to follow up on it. She's doing all that on an hourly rate, and I'm managing it, but, you know, I'm keeping track of what she's doing, and, and that's, that works really well. So there's little pieces, little things you can do, but... Um, I think being, you know, your one, your own one woman show. Don't don't let that discourage you. I mean, there's there's been moments where I'm like, ah, I can't do this all by myself, and you aren't going to be doing it all by yourself. You will find ways to integrate people that will work. So, I say, go for it. Be keeping. It's awesome. <laughs> Other questions right there. Right there. Um, I happen to live in the same small town as the uh, previous gal that just talked, uh, and I really love her beekeeping, but the reason I'm here is that I have a, a counseling business that works very well, but uh, from time to time, uh, half of my patients are unemployed looking for work and so forth, and I have been considering uh, vocational rehabilitation opportunities, including supporting a small bakery in Alberton, and uh, supporting a small beekeeping company and running uh, fiber arts retreats along with my summer camp for special needs kids. <laughs> now, the trouble is that I started out as a, an S corporation and I realized that, uh, that actually my heart is with community, with, with uh, families, with rebuilding, with legacy. My reason for being an entrepreneur is to make sure that we have quality of life in Montana in 20 years when I'm dead, maybe. <laughs> so uh, my question here is, uh, do I create a new company that is a like a training company for uh, vocational assistance back into the workplace and make it a nonprofit, which is an expense to start all over, uh, but then you're, you can get grants. And we do have the Alberton Community Foundation as a nonprofit option. Or should I stay within my current corporate S corporation structure and then have some side businesses uh, that, that help things like that? Who wants to take a shot at this one? I, I'll, I'll, um, I'll take a shot. <laughs> um, I think a couple things. One, um, as a business, it's really easy to dilute yourself and get um, sidetracked from all these opportunities. So I think coming back to what is it that you want to do, and I would try to focus in on that um, because it sounds like there's a lot going on there and there's a lot of opportunity. So I would try to hone in on what exact opportunity you want to yourself go after. Um, that would be my first recommendation. My second recommendation is we have a fabulous organization in Missoula called the Montana Community Development Corporation that Amy also spoke to. And they run the Small Business Development Center here. And they're an amazing resource for walking through this process of should I be an S Corp or um, should I be an LLC, a nonprofit, whatever. They have the resources that I think can walk you through that process. But first I would I would try to focus in on what it is you, you really want to do. One more, go ahead. Well, earlier was mentioned uh, Facebook and uh, social media, and I'm big into that in my business. I do real estate down the Bitterroot. I've just come back into the business uh, after being out of, of it for a few years. Um, one of the things that the realtors started, and I know a lot of people have washed out of the business, I think there's a real opportunity in it right now to start back into it. But in social media, the realtors across the nation have started a thing in Facebook. You might look in your, all your different areas, is that they said, if you only have $100, because a lot of us are broke, uh, what would you spend your money on? And I'll tell you what, I have gotten some incredible ideas of how to spend $100 a month. And once you put your heads together with other people. So Facebook has its face page, but it also has these underground groups that, you know, if you just type in, how do I spend $100, you know, in beekeeping, um, I'm not so sure if it had that big a group, group, but there's ways of getting it, and you can use that money very targeted. Anyway, just an idea. Well, I want to thank the panelists, uh, Amy and Christine and Margaret and Nicole. Thank you very, very much for your insight. Appreciate it. As I said earlier, we, this, this is the 10th one of these small business workshops that we've had, and one of the uh, things that...
we just don't spend enough time in is what we're what we just did here around the coffee pot and that's a uh, given time for folks to visit with one another about the challenges and successes and and failures that, that businesses have had because uh, as the previous panel spoke about and, and the first keynote said you know we can learn a lot uh, from our neighbors that are in business, whether they're in the same business or not. And so uh, it's just an opportunity. And I would just recommend that when this wraps up, if there's folks you want to talk to aggressively, go find them and visit with them uh, because it, I think it can be very, very beneficial. It has been in the past, and I'm sure it will continue to be. Our second panel is about access to capital. And uh, we have another another great panel. Um, and it is my, uh, my pleasure to introduce them. Um, and uh, I'll introduce them, and we'll do the same format as we did uh, last time. Uh, uh, first, we're going to hear from Amanda Schultz and Julie Foster. Amanda and Julie are uh, directors of the Montana Women's Business Centers. Amanda has over 10 years of marketing experience and currently has the Bozeman Women's Business Center. Now, Julie was the founder of Montana Jobs Network and, and currently heads the Western Montana Women's Business Center in Ravalli County. I want to welcome both of you ladies, and uh, and I think we'll just get going right now as folks are filing in. So, how about it? There we go. All right. Um, thank you, Senator, and to your staff for having us um, all here today, um, putting on great workshops like this for our businesses in Montana. It's very important, so thank you for, for doing that. Um, the, the significance of women-owned businesses um, in the United States uh, has an overwhelming impact on our economy. There are currently 8 million U.S. businesses that are majority women-owned, and today women-owned firms have an economic impact of $3 trillion annually, um, and that translates into the creation and maintenance of over 23 million jobs, which is 16% of all U.S. employment. Uh, Women-owned businesses are defined as uh, privately owned firms in which uh, women own, um, have the ownership of 51% or more of the business. Um, and women-owned businesses are growing at twice the rate um, of all businesses and have done so for nearly three decades. <laughs> So the most recent research findings from the Center of uh, Women's Business Research, where this data comes from, found that while 28.2% of all businesses in the U.S. are owned by women, only 42 of all revenues are generated by women-owned businesses in the United States. Um, that is certainly a very, very low number, um, considering the number of women-owned businesses um, within that. Uh, probable explanations for this are that many of these businesses, women-owned businesses, are smaller, um, and they are um, have only been around for a short period of time. Um, a lot of women-owned businesses are certainly lacking in um, the financing piece, um, as well as technical assistance um, that is necessary to help them grow their business. So with that, there's um, organizations like um, Small Business Development Centers, SCORE, um, under the, the uh, Small Business Administration. And the third piece of that, um, actually, there is also a veterans group um, assistance center um, for veterans. So um, the fourth of the resource partners available uh, is the Women's Business Center. And I'm going to talk to you about that today. Um, in 1988, the U.S. Small Business Administration established the Montana Women's Business Center program, um, and this was designed to better help women um, assist them with that technical assistance piece needed um, to help um, overcome those barriers to their success. Today, there are over 100 women's business centers around the United States, and um, that includes uh, U.S. territories as well. So um, I am the director of the Montana Women's Business Center. Um, we um, established that in 2009 under Prospera Business Network, which is, is, is a local economic development organization in Bozeman, Montana. Um, in addition to our sub-center, um, as Senator, Senator had mentioned, um, in um, in addition to the one in Bozeman, we also have two uh, sub-centers, uh, one in Hamilton um, under Ravalli County Economic Development Authority that um, Julie is the executive director of and manages that sub-center there. Um, our second is at Career Transitions in Belgrade. Um, 
each of our centers is focused, um, like the Small Business Development Centers and SCORE, we're really focused on helping um, entrepreneurs um, um, with a more of a focus on, um, on women. Um, we want to help them understand and evaluate that business idea, um, help them with feasibility studies, and help them um, when they are ready, um, whether they are in the startup phase or more established, to get that business plan going um, and have a have a, a feasible plan that they can then present to their their banker or other sources for alternative financing. We also um, help them um, understand management, business operations, marketing, and financing um, of their small business enterprise. Additionally, the Montana Women's Business Center, um, we provide um, not only the counseling and technical assistance piece, but we also provide professional development training, as well as networking and mentoring opportunities for women, because we feel that um, the focus of the Women's Business Center program um, established under the SBA really believes that mentoring for women, um, having those mat matchmaking opportunities for women to grow together and learn from one another is very important, um, as well as the networking opportunity. Women really have um, a great ability to get out there, network, um, create that word of mouth about their business, and we feel that's really important, and um, to have developed programs to support that. Currently, those programs do exist um, in, in Bozeman, but we're working on expanding those into our sub-center as well, both sub-center locations. Um, let's see here. <coughs> If, if uh, financing isn't an, um, a really an option for our businesses that we work with and our clients that we work with, we really want to educate them on ways in which um, they can grow and start their business um, with little, very, very little money. And I think that's an important piece for the counselors that are helping businesses is to be able to introduce that information to them. Um, with a, a plan, um, because financing is very important. Um, a business should always have a plan in place for future financing, so we help them develop that plan um, and, and figure out when, when that time can be when they can go after that financing to help grow their business. Um, I wanted to share with you before I turn it over to Julie, um, one of the most commonly asked questions we get at the Women's Business Center, or I get, and I'm sure the rest of you can speak here to that, is, is the information about grants. Um, there are um, a, a lot of women that I get calls from are wondering where they can access grants to help them start their business. And unfortunately, there is a lot of false information out there. There is no grants available to help women, um, no set-asides for women to start businesses. So um, we do encourage financing. And like I said, we, we encourage people to develop a plan for that if they can't do it right away. Um, there are grants available for um, already existing businesses, however. Um, many of our organizations here today have those grants available. Um, they are specific to um, already operating businesses and um, really used for, for training dollars um, to help purchase equipment, marketing, um, some inventory, um, research and development, and special projects, more industry related as well. Um, there's also um, um, certainly grants available for nonprofits and educational um, <laughs> institutions. And I think it's important, Nicole um, Hangerman had mentioned earlier, the importance of knowing your resources, knowing what resources are out there for you. Um, your local economic development organization, um, like MCDC here locally, um, River Valley County Economic Development Authority in um, Hamilton, or Prospera Business Network in um, Bozeman are here to assist you with those resources. So um, our services are free of charge, and I certainly encourage you to um, pick up the phone and, and, and contact those resources and um, get that information from them. So with that, I'll turn it over to Julie. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Amanda, and thank you, Senator Tester um, and Senator Tester's staff for an opportunity to be here today. This is really... Um, um, very, really exciting for us. Um, the Ravalli County Economic Development Authority and the Entrepreneurship Center um, 
we've really become a one-stop um, center for economic development. Um, we have the Bitterroot College program, the, um, which is a program of the University of Montana, which provides two-year education. We have the Bitterroot Job Service, which provides um, workforce. Um, so really everything that we need um, in our community under one roof, they are working together. <coughs> Um, and I know that almost all the communities in Montana have these local development corporations that do these things. So, you know, please seek them out. Um, as everyone has encouraged you to do, we have so many resources available to you. We have um, quarterly business planning classes that go through all aspects of the class, and um, it's a 101 course. We also have more in-depth courses. Um, we have about 200 people a year through those classes, um, and we jump-started those through a program with the USDA. We also have quarterly seminars um, on you know, topics such as succession planning and things like that. And most recently, um, we've become a sub-center of the Women's Business Sub-Center, which has just been um, amazing. We had a great excuse me, our grand opening just a couple weeks ago, and we had about 80 people there, and folks from all over are just, women are interested in being with other women and talking with them and finding out how they overcome these challenges um, in business and how they succeed and how they do get that work-life balance. So um, we are kicking off our WINET, which is Women's Network Entrepreneurial Training, um, and it's our brown bag, um, brown bag lunches. They start at noon and go to 1.30 um, in Hamilton at our um, Entrepreneurship Center. And they're the third Thursday of every month. Anyone is welcome to come. I've heard from a lot of folks that I met at the Women's um, Missoula Women's Business Network that they were going to join us. So our first one is actually this Thursday, the 23rd, and we have a finance um, financial management panel um, with a CPA, a financial advisor, um, and a retired business prep professor to kind of talk about all aspects of it, not just your business, but how that works into um, your family family plan financial planning as well. Um, and there are some handouts out front if you'd like to see those, um, the, the whole schedule and who's going to be there. We're also really excited about um, the Women's Business Center, um, the June, <laughs> okay, um, June 14th we have um, the Montana um, Women's Business Center semi-annual conference in Hamilton um, and Senator Tester is going to be there we're just we could not be more excited about that and I'm sorry I'm not sure I'm supposed to be announcing that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so anyway, there are some postcards out front that can tell you a little bit more about that. Um, and finally, I'd like to just um, let you all know that at, at my organization, we kind of think about a business project or a startup like a, like a pie. And you have all these different components, and those components are like the pieces of your business planning, working capital, inventory, marketing, operations, etc. Um, and I think what we're really good at at our organization um, is helping take those pieces of the pie, funding them with the financial tools available. We have two large revolving loan funds. We have a micro loan fund. Um, one of those loan funds um, derives from, um, comes from the USDA and the Montana Board of Investments. We work with local lenders to provide gap funding. And as Amanda mentioned, then what we do once we put that funding together is we, we try to find a program um, that is a grant program that can assist you. So it's, those grants aren't there to fund your business, but they're there to fund you know, a very specific part. Um, and an example is we have a manufacturing company down in the Bitterroot, and they make amazing products, some for multinational companies, um, but they didn't have an ISO certification, and they really needed that, and those are very expensive. Um, so they had funded their business. They had six employees, a lot of machinery and equipment, and a great place. Um, but they didn't have that certification that would allow them to obtain more contracts. 
Um, and so we worked with the USDA to obtain a grant to help them get that ISO certification. So I think that's a great example of how um, grants do come in um, and all those um, funding sources leverage other ones um, to, to help you get where you need to go. Um, so, you know, with that, I'd like to turn over to, to Dave um, and thank you again very much. Well, thank you, Amanda, Julie. I very much appreciate your comments, and uh, that's okay. Sorry, right. didn't know it. <laughs> you know, I thought I was supposed to be out too, so it's all right. Yeah. Dave Glazier is the uh, is the president of Montana Community Development Corporation, located right here in Missoula. And prior to coming to MCDC, Dave served as uh, chief operating office and environmental scientist for environmental consulting firms here. And uh, he's also board the chair, board board chair for. Homeward, which is a statewide low-income housing organization that does some really good work, too, I might add. So, uh, Dave, it's up to you now. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with one other piece of my bio that I think is very important, and that is that I am the son of a woman who ran an emergency room in the downtown metro area. And so, because of that, I grew up understanding who was in charge at all times. <laughs> <laughs> Nurses run the world. So with that context, Montana CDC, MCDC is a statewide not-for-profit not bank for all intents and purposes. We lend money to businesses and people that fall outside of bankability for whatever reason, and there are lots of those reasons. In addition to our capital that we provide to those businesses, we also provide consulting. And we do that through small business development centers in Bozeman and Missoula. And we do it through procurement technical assistance centers, which helps businesses uh, with federal, state, and local government contracting in Kalispell and Missoula. So we truly provide a, a statewide product for Montana business. When you're looking at why people fall outside of bankability, um, it, I know going to a bank and asking for a loan is a very personal thing, and when a bank says no, it, it, it hurts. You know, at some level, you're being told you're not good enough. And, and the fact is, is I can tell you that there are a whole lot of people out there who have been told no, and, and, and they're just fine. There are just lots of reasons now why people aren't able to get bank financing. And so we are a, one alternative to help get you back to bankability. A couple of interesting statistics. Um, when you look at our lending over the last three and a half years, 43% of the loans we made were to women-owned businesses. That's a very high figure. 30% of that 43% were to low-income women. Again, a very strong figure. I ran through the numbers before I came. I, I, I was very pleased to see that we're hitting target markets as an institution. We target uh, people who have traditionally been underserved in uh, the capital markets, women, Native Americans, low-income people, low-income places, and rural communities. So we use our loan funds uh, to, to help those individuals get to bankability. We borrow money from uh, USDA Rural Development, just to my right, so I have to be nice to him, right? And then we also borrow money from the SBA. There are plenty of folks from the SBA here. He's just a little further down the road. Uh, uh, as well as many other uh, sources. Uh, and we like to work in conjunction. There have been many references to local development organizations. We like to work with all of those uh, groups across the state. Um, we had a really nice big one we did with Julie a few years ago. So uh, anyway, uh, I appreciate you coming today. I have a bunch of handouts. If you want to come up afterwards, I can give you that information. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dave. And, and part of this is absolutely getting getting folks in touch with the people that can help them. And, and so be sure and grab those handouts. Uh, John Guthmiller is our next panelist. John is a business and cooperative uh, program director for USDA Rural Development. And John has been with USDA for over 20 years. He doesn't look it, but he has. Thank you. And he works out of the, uh, the Bozeman Office for Rural Development. Truly uh, one of the good guys. John? Thanks, Senator. Pleasure to be here this morning, and, uh, and, and for a good cause. I mean, um, you know, starting and developing a successful business from scratch is, is just 
an incredible venture for anybody. It has my anybody that has gone through that or is doing that has my deepest admiration. That that is uh, the. The ultimate success in my mind is to start something, your own creation from scratch and, and continue forward with that and make it work. Um, and there's no magic bullets up here, you know. I mean, we have programs that can assist and help, but, but there's nothing uh, outside of your dedication and, and willingness to make it work that really is going to make it work. So I applaud all of you going through that process or have gone through that process. I'm John Guth Miller. I'm with the USDA Rural Development uh, and our agency of the uh, USDA. Uh, charged with providing economic development assistance in the rural areas of the country. Uh, uh, that means that all of Montana is eligible for our programs with the exception of Missoula, Great Falls, and Billings. Now, why they're not considered rural, I don't know, but uh, so you have to go outside the state, city limits and to be eligible. But um, I have a number of programs. I think uh, we have three separate departments within the uh, Rural Development Agency, the Rural Utilities, which includes uh, water and wastewater, <coughs> rural and telephone cooperative assistance. Um, then we also have our single family and multifamily housing, and then all of, all of our business programs. Mm -hmm. And together we put about $400 million into the state of Montana last year. So we're, we're big in providing uh, assistance in, in making the economy grow in Montana. In the business programs, uh, I have a number of, of, of grants, loans, and loan guarantees that we make available uh, to the businesses. And, and as I found out in the past, I always talk about the grants first because nobody pays attention until I get to the grant part. So I'll start with the grants. Um, we do have grants, uh, but for the most part, they're not direct grants to businesses. Uh, not completely true, but for the most part, our grants uh, are, go through third parties. Uh, the development corporations generally apply to us for grants to assist a business. Most of our grants are, are, are to provide technical assistance or training type dollars. In other words, do you need uh, help um, with a, a feasibility study or a marketing plan or, or uh, software development uh, or, or, or uh, website development? You know, you can't pay for your operating expenses but can help with uh, the professional assistance in getting some of the things done that your business needs to go forward. Uh, so we do have those grants um, that, that do provide assistance uh, indirectly to help get through some of that startup and growing phase. We also have some grants that are direct grants, but they're for a specific purpose. Our renewable energy grant uh, provides a grant of 25% for a small business or an agricultural producer uh, to install renewable energy or improve energy efficiency of their existing uh, facilities. Um, and, and, and that program is really growing. We had a record year in providing grants last year, and we're looking for a lot more interest in the programs this year. We also have a value-added producer grant where we provide grants to agricultural producers for adding value to their business. So if they're, if they're already producing an ag product and they want to process it and, and, and make it a value added and sell it to uh, the good food store or somebody, someplace else around town, um, you know, they can apply for a grant up to 50% up to, up to, uh, of developing a feasibility study or even once they get past the feasibility study stage, 50% uh, of the working capital. Now, they can't use it for machinery, equipment, or real estate, but they can use it for 50% of working capital of getting that bit, that uh, product to market. Okay, and that's that's usually pretty good assistance. So, th those are our grants that we provide available. We also have loans and uh, loan guarantees, and our, most of our loans are given through uh, the revolving loan fund loans. In other words, we we make loans to MCDC and and other development corporations around the state uh, to provide a revolving loan fund. We give it to them thirty years at one percent, allows them to develop a, a, a revolving loan fund to make small loans to small businesses throughout the state. It's been very successful in Montana. In fact, Montana is one of the largest users of the program in the country, uh, thanks to uh, the outstanding development corporations that we have fostered in the state. They do a wonderful job out there, and and uh, you know, putting together the the puzzle, the jigsaw puzzle of federal and state programs for all of the businesses to to, to to take part in, uh, they do a great job. Um, our loan guarantees, we do have a business and industry loan guarantee program where we do guarantee commercial loans through your local lender. Um, and, and this program, like our other programs, is to make uh, economic assistance and loan financial assistance available to rural areas of the country. Um, and, and so 
Well, we guarantee a loan, again, has to be in a rural area. We guarantee a loan to a business, and that opens up uh, the secondary market. There's a secondary market for loan guarantees, much like there's a secondary market for housing loans. You heard of Freddie Mae, or Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Well, there's also Farmer Mac and Montana Board of Investments that purchases those guarantees, and they can pass on the lower interest rate and terms that are available that sometimes are better than the bank rates. Um, so it also gives a bank a little bit of a cushion uh, to fall back upon uh, and maybe take a risk that he nor normally might not otherwise. So, But those are the programs that we have. Um, uh, I'll be, there's a uh, table outside with a bunch of my handouts. I'll be out there for a little bit afterwards. So if you have any questions, uh, please come talk to me. And Senator, thanks again for having me here. And I'll turn it back over to you. Well, thanks, John. Thanks for your comments. Joe, Joe McClure is our next panelist. Joe's also been around a while. He is a Montana district director for the Montana <laughs> State. Sorry about that, Joe. I had to throw that in. Uh, he is uh, he is the Montana district director for the State of Montana Small Business Administration, a critical player in Montana. He's responsible for delivery of SBA programs throughout Montana, including a loan portfolio of almost 2,000 loans, more than $300 million, oversight of 10 small business development centers, and a women's business center. Uh, so good to have you here, Joe. Great. Thank you, Senator. Um, I, I think a couple of the panelists have, have hit on a lot of good topics, but I just want to talk a little bit about the U.S. Small Business Administration and what our role is uh, to helping you to access capital. I mean, that's really what it's all about. What do I need to do if you're sitting there in your chair? What do I need to do tomorrow? What do I need to do the next day to access capital to get my business started, grow my business, um, and hopefully, from, from our perspective, I think, hopefully create some jobs and create some economic growth in, in the state of Montana. Um, as uh, the senator mentioned, SBA is a, is a federal agency and my office is responsible for administering the programs throughout the state of Montana. So, um, you know, Montana is kind of a, a small state, so we've got a huge staff to, to be able to handle all that. We've got about nine folks um, in the whole state of Montana. And really what we do is we work through our, um, our local organizations, our local resource partners. So when you think about the SBA, um, we're not, we're not, we don't make direct loans. Um, for the most part, we don't make grants to private businesses, um, but we do, what we do is try to work through our resource partners throughout the state. So when you think about SBA, you really want to think about the three C's, credit, counseling, and then contracting. And I'm really here to, to talk mostly about credit, but counseling, as uh, the senator mentioned, we, uh, we help fund through the state. Uh, Department of Commerce and some federal dollars and then matched with some local dollars are 10 small business development centers throughout the state and they're located from Kalispell over to Wolf Point and and eight places in between and, and we've got some information outside to help you depending on where you're at. Dave Glazier and his group um, host that small business development center here in Missoula as well as in Bozeman and then we have our women's business center that also assists uh, people um, with their business planning and that's really where it starts is at the Cal counseling st um, stage and putting that business plan together, figuring out, you know, what do I need, how much do I need, what is my startup um, f financial needs, putting that cash flow together. I heard somebody talk about working on your cash flow statement. That's critical when you're accessing capital. Um, whoever's going to lend you the money, whether it's the local development organization or your banker um, or a USDA program, um, they're going to want to know how are you going to pay it back. So they want to know what are you going to use it for, how are you going to pay it back, and oh, by the way, if you don't pay it back, what am I going to do to get my money back from you? What kind of collateral do you have? And then it's that all-important character. You know, what's your character? Do you pay your bills on time? Do you, do you have the, the character that it takes to run a business? Um, and do you have an understanding of what your business looks like? So. From a counseling side, we've got the Women Business Centers and we've got the Small Business Development Centers. I heard um, a young lady ask, you know, am I in this by myself? Absolutely not. And you don't have to pay to have what, what, what somebody else mentioned is a kitchen cabinet. Your banker, I'm sure everybody has a banker. Walk in and see that person and say, 
hey, how are things going way before you need a loan? Walk in and say, how are things going in the bank? What are you guys doing from a community standpoint? Find out more about that banker's personal life. You know, <laughs> seriously, it's all, about, it's all about relationships, right? If you walk in, and I know Pam, because I've seen Pam for the last year walk in my bank and say, how are things going with the kids? I see on the soccer field. I think I'll, I'm going to take a shot if Pam wants a loan for me. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about that from our banker side. But, you know, get to know that banker. That could be a kitchen cabinet member, your insurance agent. What kind of insurance do you need? That's a kitchen cabinet person that you don't have to pay for other than your policy premium. Your accountant, everybody has to do their taxes, right? So get that person on your kitchen cabinet. Find out how they can help you understand what your needs are from an accounting standpoint. And then you have the free services of our counselors at the Small Business Development Center and also your local development organizations like the rest of, of uh, um, the team at MCDC and then your other um, economic development. Just go on line and Google local economic development organizations and you'll find an economic development organization wherever you live. And those folks are primarily funded by local and then federal and state dollars all put together, but their job is to make sure you're successful. So by no means are you in it by yourself. So start with that and, and pull those those kitchen cabinet members into your into your team. And then when you look at, at uh, credit, the SBA, what we do is we work through local banks, we work through groups like Dave uh, Glazier and, and local development organizations, and what we do is provide a guarantee to those folks. Instead of having a bunch of federal employees running around making loans, these folks do it all the time. The bankers do it, the local economic development organizations do it. They know who you are, they know what the needs are. So what we do is we provide, like um, the USDA does, we provide a guarantee up to 85% of that loan amount to the bank so that they can feel comfortable making that loan to you. We also have our microloan program statewide that uh, Dave Glazier MCDC administers for us. We in turn lend the money to them and then they lend it out to small businesses. So you have a, a variety of resources out there, but from the SBA standpoint, we're here to help get your business plan put together through our small business development centers and our women business center, and then also stand behind those folks that are gonna actually cut you the check and make that loan available to you. So really, depending on what your need is, you can access that through some of our local resources. You can also go to sba.gov slash MT. That's our local uh, Montana website and take a look at all the information that's on there. I'll also be out front afterwards. We can answer all your questions, shoot you in the right direction, but it's all about personal relationships, especially when you're getting started. People want it, they're gonna lend you money, they're gonna lend it to Pam. They're not gonna lend it to you know, Pam's boutique. They're gonna say, Pam, are you a, are you a worthy <laughs> candidate for my, loan, for my loan dollars? And do I think you're gonna pay me back? That's who they're gonna lend it to. So until you develop those relationships up front with those local folks, they can't even access our programs to help them make that decision. So that's my, my main point is get out there, make those connections, and this is a great opportunity to do that. And I really thank the Senator and his staff for pulling these together over, over the last few years because I know they've been well attended and I know we've seen some great out, outcomes from them. And I know we've had some conversations with folks as well coming from these small business workshops. So. Um, again, like uh, John said, I take my hat off to those of you who are willing to risk it all and go into business. Um, it's phenomenal. My, my father was an entrepreneur and I saw how hard he worked, but I also saw the, the value that he brought to the family and, and he was able to raise me and my sisters. And so to me, that's huge. I don't have the stomach for it, so I'm gonna sit back and be a service provider for him. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Appreciate the work you do. Uh, we are very, very fortunate to have Leslie Jensen here today. Leslie is uh, Vice President of Commercial Banking at First Interstate Bank in Missoula. To say that we've been through some challenging times over the last uh, three or four years has been, uh, would be a gross understatement, but Leslie has seen, uh, seen um, well, I mean, she's seen tough times and hopefully we'll see a lot of good times coming up. She's worked in the financial industry for over 25 years. She serves on the boards of the Missoula Art Museum and the Clark Fork River Market. We thank you for being here today, Leslie. Thank you, Senator Tester, and thank you to your staff for pulling this together and also to the university for hosting the event today. Am I um, at a good level? Okay. Well, this uh, workshop is called Access to Capital, and banks are one of the places where 
uh, you have some opportunity to access capital, and that might be for the purpose of starting a business, it might be for the purpose of growing the existing business that you have, or it might be uh, expressly to purchase some specific asset, whether it be a vehicle or some machinery, et cetera. And I want to give a special shout out to the women business owners who presented earlier because you did so much of my work for me. And it's nice to have a business owner suggesting that people need to do uh, cash flow statements and business plans instead of just being the banker um, making those types of requests. But uh, the importance of gathering, analyzing, understanding your own business, uh, wherever, whatever stage that y your business is in, if you're a startup, if you've been in business for a few years and you're trying to figure out how to grow or how to streamline or perhaps how to delve into another product line, you really are the individuals who need to understand your business and have uh, an ability to either put together the information yourself to convey that business to someone else or to gather up the professionals and the resources who can help you do it. And you've been presented with a lot of those types of people here today. Um, one of the pieces of information that we're going to be looking for when you are wanting to access capital <coughs> is called the sources and uses. And you have ideas about how you'd like to use money and <coughs> the other side of that uh, equation, if you will, is what the sources of, of the money are going to be, and the bank is certainly one of them, but it might be that there are a variety of sources. We always like to see you have a little bit of your own money into any project that you're doing, and it might be that there's also a need for us to look to several different sources, some of which have been presented here today already, the SBA, MCDC, some other uh, micro-loan funds and that type of thing that we might partner with in order to put together a package that really enables the bank to participate in uh, providing the access to capital and um, closes some of the some of the gaps that we would have if we were just doing it ourselves. Uh, the other thing I think is important is for everyone to educate themselves on what types of sources there are for capital and what the criteria might be to be eligible for that source of capital. It's going to help you identify where might be the proper avenue for you and and hopefully it will also help to resolve some of the uh, fear around approaching people when, when you're wanting to talk with them about basically investing in your business you know when you apply at a bank or you apply through MCDC or uh, one of the other programs presented you're not asking anyone to give you anything and I think sometimes that the fear that small business owners have is because they have a sense that they're coming with hat in hand and they're being at they're asking to be given something well you're really asking um, to have somebody make an investment in you and your business and and you have very good reasons why you think that's a good investment to make and really it's just a matter of presenting that case and identifying the proper source for the investment so that if you if you do not receive your funding from a particular source it, it doesn't have to be so personal it's really about and I used to use this um, metaphor and I don't know if people appreciate it or not but sometimes if you if you are pre-bankable let's say and you go to a bank and, and request money and then the banker ultimately says no uh, it can it can feel very personal but really what I like to think of it as is trying to get coke out of a Pepsi machine you know if you if you wanted Pepsi you really needed to go to a Pepsi machine and, and put your money in rather than go to a coke machine and that's a much more sort of objective way of looking at it so where do banks come in this access to capital? I think of it as being somewhat of a spectrum. And um, maybe on the far end of the spectrum in terms of the amount of risk that the investor is willing to take and, and of course, what they're going to charge you for taking the risk is uh, maybe your traditional venture capital funds that are, you know, charging interest rates in the mid-20s and want to piece of ownership and control of the board and you know etc and you have the type of company that potentially can grow uh, in a way that 
makes you interesting to them from an investment standpoint. Well, then, you know, sort of somewhere in the center, you've got um, what I would refer to as credit enhancement partners, and the SBA and the USDA, BNI program, are both those in my mind. They enhance, you might be at a bank looking for credit, and we look to them to enhance your ability to get credit from us because there's some gap that we're uncomfortable with. We're not quite there with being able to do the financing without utilizing those tools. I also think of alternative financing sources as being in that middle range. Dave Glazier's organization and, and the two ladies at the end, I'm sorry, I'm not as familiar with you. Um, for people who are pre-bankable or, or even when you're gonna be using a bank, but there's a little bit of a gap in that financing and we can uh, work as in partnership with those organizations to put together the full package. And then really on the, on the far end of the spectrum, both in terms of how much risk banks are willing to take and therefore really how much we get paid, we're, we're pretty much the lowest cost provider of credit. And, and that simply has evolved over time to be the niche that banks play in business financing. There's not, you know, doesn't make us better or worse or any different really from other investors. That's just the, the particular role that we play. Well, if you provide low cost money, one of the things that becomes imperative is that you don't lose very much money. That means we, we, we more so than some of the folks on the other end of the spectrum, venture capitalists take a lot of risk, but when there's a payoff, it's big. When, but they lose money too. Well, we, we don't like to take big risks and um, basically in compensation for that, we don't charge very much for our money. But we're really looking uh, to reassure ourselves that the money can be repaid and in doing so, we're, we're really looking at three different sources of repayment. Uh, primary always being cash flow, and if you're an existing business, you should be able to show how with what you make and how you're gonna grow what you make, you can pay your loan back. If you're a startup business, it's more challenging to get financing because we're working off of projections. Here's what I think my business is gonna do, and my business has to do that in order to pay my loan back. Uh, the secondary source is generally collateral, and that's where if you, if you don't have enough collateral to support your loan, then we can look to some of these other uh, programs, the SBA, USDA guarantees, also to MCDC and other alternative financiers to help us close that gap. The third source is always you being the principal of your business. And that goes to character, how you've managed your credit in the past. It goes to your management experience and skill, how, how you present your cap capability in running this business and making it successful. And it also goes to whether you have some level of personal resource outside of the business. You know, many people start their business while they still have a day job. Right, and they grow it somewhat organically. And those types of things can be helpful in um, making sure that there's uh, enough of that risk is addressed so that then we can make you that low cost loan. Um, the, I want to stress that banks, while we are a source of access for capital, we, we have um, so much more to offer you and we have an important relationship and, and we'd really like to have that relationship with you. Um, I think sometimes people feel nervous about going into a bank. We're all people. We live and work in this community. We shop at the same places that you do. We have kids in Little League. We, we're, we're just the same people that you are. We just work in a different building than the one that you work in. And I would like to encourage people not to feel shy or nervous about sitting down and talking with a banker because we can really assist you in answering questions about how credit works and what type of a loan you would look for if you were going to do this particular thing. We can help you structure the um, deal that you're looking for. And we also have products and services that serve as a bridge to a deeper and broader access to capital. So for example, your business checking account is a really important bridge to capital. And the reason it is is because, um, first and foremost, you're keeping your business deposits and expenses separate, and therefore you can outline what your business is doing uh, a little bit better. And it also is a credit reference. If you handle your business credit account well, somebody is gonna come to me at some point and say, 
Amy is looking for a line of credit from us and we want to know, they basically ask you what your experience has been with this person's um, business checking account. And so it's a, an important bridge to um, broader, deeper capital access. The small business credit card, I think, is an underutilized tool sometimes as in terms of being a bridge. It's relatively inexpensive. You can pay 15% on a credit card, and it's still cheaper than getting a $5,000, $10,000 line of credit and paying the application fees and probably still a reasonable interest rate in order to make it possible for us to provide that credit. And we've got employees and overhead and uh, a cost of actually providing the money in the first place. And so your, your business credit card is it's inexpensive, relatively speaking. It's very accessible. And if it's appropriately managed, it's, it's really one of the primary ways for a business to access revolving credit, a line that you can just take up and down as your business needs it. And then the other uh, thing that we have is products and services that help you, one, collect money more quickly from your customers, and two, effectively and timely pay your vendors. And so this is something that will also give you credit references that then you take out uh, when you're seeking more access to capital. And your banker also, uh, we, we have so much to offer, <laughs> not just but not just being your community member or, or loans. We're a source of information. Uh, we can be a reference. We certainly can be your advocate. We can be a trusted provider of those products and services to you. And we can be an informal business advisor. So I think that, uh, and we're happy to be tapped in all of those roles. We, we want to have relationships with our customers that help us build and grow our business because we're business people too. And if we can serve in that role with you, we know that we're going to get there. So uh, I'll close. And um, I would just like to encourage people in terms of giving your business the best opportunity uh, to access capital when you need it is to understand, understand your strategy and be able to convey it, to learn about the various sources of capital and what they offer and what the criteria for access is, to form a business relationship with a bank, get to know your banker and use them as a resource, thanks for that plug Joe, uh, as your business develops and grows. And um, it, I would just like to take a moment to uh, introduce the, we have business bankers from First Interstate Bank here today, and I have with me Sabrina Garcia, Stacy Mueller, and Kay Wenzel. Ladies, can you just stand, please? <laughs> Sabrina and Stacy are at our North Reserve branch. Kay and I are at the downtown branch, and we also have business bankers at our south branch on Brooks. And. Um, we are all available as business bankers in these convenient locations to help you with uh, all of your business banking needs. I would like to encourage you to support women-owned businesses. You know, men have been successful in business for, what, 1,000 years now, in part because they're hardworking and, and effective uh, business entrepreneurs themselves. But I think almost more so because they have always had this strong network of support. Uh, and, and women, I think, can improve on how we support one another. And one of those ways is to uh, do business with a woman-owned business. So I would like to encourage you to do that. And I also um, appreciate that what the business owners up here said. It seemed clear that you all have unique businesses, that there's no one right path. Um, every business at whatever stage of its life cycle needs to have a good business banker, and I want to reiterate that we at First Interstate Bank would, we would like to do business with you. So, good luck. Thanks, Lizzie. Thank you very much. Um, Liz Markey, last but certainly not least. Liz is the, uh, the fund coordinator for the Frontier Angel Fund. Liz, Liz is a co-founder of Norfolk Strategies. She has an extensive background in legislative and public policy issues related to business growth and development at both the state and federal levels. And I'm here to attest to the fact when I was in state government, Liz was there advocating for policies for uh, capital and the same thing at the federal level. So good to have you here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Senator Tester. I tell you, the first time I laid eyes on John Tester, I knew with that haircut he was going places. <laughs> 
So um, I want to just dovetail. Leslie is absolutely right. Capital is a continuum, and I sort of live between the bleeding edge and the cutting edge of capital in Montana. I have uh, a long background in economic development, and my elevator pitch for economic development has always been building effective public-private partnerships for sustaining private investments. And when I came here, I cannot tell you, I have never seen a state that has more public uh, programs, services, uh, it's just an amazing um, array of, uh, of opportunity for business development on the public side. What I didn't see a lot of was a lot of private investment going on and partnering together. So um, as a businesswoman and, and in my profession, I said, you know, that's the piece I'm going to focus on here. It's slow, I'm impatient, but I tell you, it's coming along. Uh, in 2006, while I was still working in a privately funded economic development organization, we closed a small angel fund. We are the most remote angel fund in the United States. And I actually have one of the most amazing angel funds in the United States. I have 33 investors, most of whom uh, live in Montana. We actually have five states of residency. Um, they all are people who have a double bottom line. They want to make money, but they want to do good and give back. They love entrepreneurs. They are women, men, doctors, uh, chemists. Uh, veterinarians, uh, people who have managed a lot of money, three or four professional investors, CEOs, CFOs, and they have been so incredibly dedicated to this effort in Montana. Um, we have a really strong desire to grow innovation new businesses in Montana, and to certainly bump that number up for revenue for women from 4.2%. <laughs> Equity-backed ventures pay almost twice the wages of debt-financed ventures. And I think all of you agree mm -hmm. we need more businesses in Montana that pay higher wages. Good examples of Montana businesses that are equity-backed and, and started with private individuals and then have grown through venture are Ligasite Pharmaceuticals, Printing for Less, um, Applied Materials, which w recently bought Semitool, and then just most recently, Right Now Technologies, which was sold to Oracle for a billion and a half dollars. So we want to be there for the entrepreneur who truly has ambition to grow and scale a business. We're almost the opposite of debt. <laughs> Equity, uh, Life, let me just go two places with this. A lifestyle business is a fabulous business, and I completely support those. I have one of those. I sell Wagyu beef out of our ranch, and that's my lifestyle business. I'm trying to build income for me as an individual. Entrepreneurs that want to scale a business are interested in building equity for investors who take very significant risk. We are forward-looking. We're not going to look at your credit score. We're going to look at how big is the market. How capable are you of exploiting that market? What's your go-to-market strategy? What is your exit? Um, it's a completely different analysis. We would much rather see um, an A team with a B idea than a, than a B team with an A idea. But the most important thing is that you need that. In, you, if you want funding from, from an equity-backed uh, venture, either an angel group or a venture capitalist, you need to have that ambition to scale. So um, what do we invest in? We invest in high tech, low tech, and no tech, but we want you to have a proprietary product or service, um, and we want you to want to exit your business at some point in the future. So Frontier Fund, we, our website is frontierangels.com. I've got cards up here. Our fund meets every other month in person. In the opposite months, we screen deals through a uh, online platform called Gust. Um, and I am happy to say, Senator Tester, as a benchmark to all your guard work, we had the most applications for funding the last eight weeks since we closed our fund in 2006, which is really exciting for us as investors and for Montana. But I think for the difference that these kinds of events where we network, it's not one or the other. It's, it's the collaboration and understanding the right path to financing. And I've got to plug um, the Governor's Office of Economic Development, and particularly Pat Wise, who is here. Uh, most of you may have heard of Bill Payne, a very well-known angel investor globally who lives here in Montana part-time. But he and I have written a, a curriculum that uh, the State Workforce Investment Board has financed called 
financing a high impact venture where we really spend half a day with entrepreneurs talking about the various paths to finance and the and sort of the how much can you raise for whom for what and when so um, I'm going to just close with um, a couple of things I highly recommend this book. We use this as part of our teaching strategy. It's called Startup by a woman who's both an angel investor and runs a venture capital firm in Cincinnati. It's called uh, Startup by Elizabeth Edwards. She will help you find $100,000 to start your business. I swear to God, it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Everything from couponing to how to get cheaper insurance, but really to position yourself to start a business um, of your own. But sort of our pearls of wisdom, um, and I look at these actually every day in my own business. I also chair the board of the Flathead Beacon, which is an equity-backed enterprise in the Flathead. We have 15 employees. Um, and I look at these every day, and I encourage you to as well, whether you're growing a high-impact venture or just uh, or just working in a lifestyle business, which is so hard. Um, but start with the end in mind. I love that Nicole said that your exit st starts at the beginning. Uh, what are your top three objectives? Recalculate those every day, and if sales aren't on your list, you're in trouble. Your focus is your future. You really are what you do every day. Ask your customers. They will tell you everything you need to know. Customers are so important. Um, Pre-sell, close, sell, close, get the money in the door. Time is money. Nothing comes in your door until a sale is made. Never assume anything. Trust, but verify. <laughs> you're sued, you're screwed. I can't tell you how many businesses, especially a small business, you can't fight, you can't fight City Hall, and you can't fight deep pockets. And I say that in all deference to my four partners at North Fork who are all attorneys. And you can't grow a business without a team. Uh, a team is just absolutely critical. And at the end of the day, cash is king. And I think everybody will agree with that here. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I'd love to see more women um, apply to our fund. We are invested in two companies that are run by women, but um, I'd like to see a lot more. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, Liz. And I think we got time for, uh, we got about five minutes for questions. So rock and roll right there. Yep, go ahead, right here, yep. Um, just in the commercial bank history, Oftentimes, I work a little commercial real estate, etc. So, when you have um, a client who comes into the area and they are going to a bank and they've got their business plan set up, sometimes the bankers, the commercial bankers, if it's that initial <coughs> consultation, will give them some forms to fill out to help them guide them. But what I have found is there are many lenders who are not trained to lead the client to the resources. And so the client walks out and goes, oh, here's a good idea that went down the tubes. So I'm just encouraging somebody like yourself, if you haven't already, to get in touch with some of these other commercial lenders. I just saw a good one, Kathy Schulte, walk through, who has always been so instrumental in guiding them through the process. Sure. But I'd love to see more of the commercial lenders, rather than send them out the door give them the resources that they, they know about. Right. Well, I do, I agree with you. Um, just like anyone else, commercial lenders get busy in their jobs and they don't take enough time to really educate themselves about what resources are out there. And also maybe some of them aren't taking a long range view on helping a, a prospective client find uh, the type of lending that maybe doesn't even involve the bank, if that person thinks you really help them, then there might be an opportunity for a relationship with them down, down the path. But what I would encourage you, now you know um, an important resource, and that's First Interstate Bank. And, and you know that we, we know what resources are out there, and we're going to do that work to help guide them, those clients. Other questions? Way in the back. business that a startup business that's not 
um, a service business, you can count things and decide how much money you're going to make by how many things you sell. What advice do you have to someone who is starting a service business about how to count clients and um, project revenue? Who wants to volunteer? <laughs> So every single industry on the planet has uh, benchmarks by which they should set themselves. And in a service industry, typically what you see are billable hours, time spent actually interfacing with the client. Now, it may not be true necessarily for your industry, but um, depending on where you live, you should just touch base with one of the resources mentioned today, and they can help set you up to understand what that looks like on the revenue side. Okay. One more question. One more. Hand up. Right there. Right, either one of them, take your pick, tweet. Um, in coming to your meeting today, I have a small business, and I'm not really interested in borrowing a lot of money, but I am interested in what it takes to find an employee and other aspects. And this is the second time I've gone to one of your opportunity workshops, and maybe the next time you could be a little broader in scope. Sure. Instead of having everybody just be on finance, as I was hoping to be a little broader. Okay, no problem. Okay, thank we'll, you. We'll take it, you bet. There's some, um, by the way, there's some real opportunity for, uh, I don't know how well trained of a workforce you need, but uh, partnering with uh, community colleges and, uh, and colleges of technology uh, can really, uh, I can just tell you that's, that's a given that's out there. I think Liz can talk about what Flathead Valley Community College has done for the business environment up there. I can tell you that the COT here in Missoula and there's others throughout the state do an incredible job. And those just aren't, those are just two because we're right here. So, and then there's workforce training dollars that are put through. Um, Others too. So there's, there's plenty of opportunity. But that's a good. That's a good suggestion for another one. Last one, I guess. I don't have a question. I'm um, just have a plug for the SBA. Um, I'm Kim Morisaki. I do what a lot of these people do up in the Flathead, and the SBA just put together a program and brought it to the state called Profit Mastery. And um, I don't know which other areas they can teach it. But I know that the SBDC director in Kalispell teaches it. It's a fantastic course. It addresses for small businesses what a lot of these people have chatted about today, knowing your numbers, knowing your cash flow, knowing your break-even points. It's a two-day course. And it's probably the one thing that I would recommend to every small business that walks into my office is to take the time to take that class. And if you're already in business, you can probably access Department of Labor incumbent workforce training grant money to pay for it. So if you have an interest in that, maybe Joe can tell us where else in the state you can take those classes. You know, it really depends on uh, the Small Business Development Center in your area, but again, uh, the communities that we're in include Billings, Bozeman, Butte, Coal Strip, Great Falls, Haver, Helena, Kalispell, Missoula, and Wolf Point. So pretty much across the state, you, could, you can reach a Small Business Development Center director, uh, like in Kalispell, and they can, they can hook you up with that. Okay, I want to thank this panel, Amanda and Julie and Dave and John and Joe and Leslie and Liz. Thank you all. As we um, get ready for the next keynote, um, I would tell you, it's in, uh, we're going to have a guy by the name of Dan Hanneher introduce the keynote speaker uh, that's coming right up. But before I introduce Dan, I just wanted to say... Uh, um, I really want to thank uh, Sharon Vosmeck for, for coming in and, and, uh, and agreeing to be our speaker at the last minute. Uh, she's, um, there's no doubt in my mind she's going to be doing a great job because she's got a lot to offer and very, very, very much uh, in tune with what this seminar uh, is doing here today. So with that, I want to introduce to you Dan Hanneher. Dan is a Region 8 Administrator for the Small Business Administration. Dan Region includes Montana. And prior prior to be appointed by the SBA re, prior to be appointed to the SBA regional administrator, uh, Dan helped run his family furniture store in Fargo, North Dakota. So would you help me welcome Dan Hanner?
Thank you, Senator. Uh, I was going to mention that as well. It, it always uh, makes people a little more attentive in audiences like this when I say that I'm not a government bureaucrat. I'm just a political appointee, and uh, I spent uh, over 30 years in small business myself. I've had three SBA loans and uh, love now to be on the other side uh, and advocating for our counseling, capital access, and contracting programs. Uh, but I'm, I'm very pleased to be here today to introduce Sharon Bosnack, CEO of Ostia, to you. Uh, Ostia is a global not-for-profit organization built on a community of men and women dedicated to the success of women-led high-growth ventures and Interestingly, uh, they're dedicated to the eradication of the need for their organization within the decade. As CEO of Ostia, Sharon has an unwavering passion and uniquely well-suited background to drive forward the company's mission of propelling women-owned high-growth entrepreneurial businesses to success. She draws from her expertise in public policy, economic gender analysis, management consulting, and entrepreneurship to build Ostia's powerful network of diverse resources that serve to mobilize and help promising women-led businesses. <clears throat> Research indicates that if women were to fully participate in high-growth entrepreneurship, we would see a significant and measurable benefit to the economy, innovation, and society. To that end, Sharon has led the efforts to double Ostia's resources, which include mentors, coaches, sponsors, investors, thought leaders, and serial entrepreneurs. She has expanded Ostia's entrepreneur program, which holds the potential to transform high-growth startups into market leaders by giving them unprecedented access to Ostia's global network of angels, venture capitalists, corporations, and entrepreneurs, as well as expert coaching. Currently, programs are held in Silicon Valley, New York, London, and in India. The entrepreneur program has resulted in, on average, 60% of participating companies securing funding or achieving a successful exit within one year of presenting, totaling more than $1 billion raised and 21 exits, including two IPOs. Ms. Vosmack joined Ostia in 2004 and, and has served as CEO since 2007. Prior to joining Ostia, she founded SJ Vosmack & Associates, a management firm that included clients such as PG&E, PacBell, and the University of Wisconsin. She also previously held management positions and worked for Senator Dennis DeConcini. Sharon also currently serves on the steering committee of the Sherry Blair Foundation, the Stevenage Bioscience Catalyst Experts Advisor Group, and the City of San Francisco Mayor's Commission on Biotech. As the leader of Ostia, a unique organization focused on women-led startups, celebrating, inspiring, and accelerating high-growth entrepreneurship, we're lucky to have her here with us today. Let's give her a warm, big sky welcome. So while they set this up, I don't do podiums well. So we're gonna we're gonna walk. Thank you. I assume there's a clicker here somewhere. <coughs> here? Okay. So while he sets me up, I am Sharon Bosmick, CEO and of Astia. And the way I look at it is I'm either keeping you from way more important stuff or I'm your keynote today. I'm going to look at it as I'm your keynote and you want to be here. And I do want to thank the senator for having me today. And yes, I did save your ass. Okay. So now that we've got that straight, and anytime I want to go skiing, he's going to invite me back to speak to you. We're all we're all on a level playing field, and we know where we are. So I'm going to be um, speaking about a bit of a different topic today. Uh, our first keynote this morning, Dr. Moore, I th thought did a great job of articulating the importance of focus and making sure you know who your customer is. At Astia, we serve a very specific customer. And I want to define some terms so that you know who my customer is and you can opt in. So innovation is my key. I'm looking for innovative companies. And by innovation, I do mean companies that are seeking to change the world. Either changing the world through an innovative business approach, changing the world through an innovative technology, 
changing the world through some impact. And I think that all of the entrepreneurs you saw here today are great examples of innovators. My companies that I serve are targeting changing the world with a diverse leadership team. They must have a woman on the founding team. And once again, I need to define terms. I'm not talking women-owned. I'm talking women-led. And we'll get into what the difference is. So through my talk, I'd like to outline for people when you're going to see lunch. So I'm going to start with why I believe innovation matters and why you should care about it. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how you can create a culture of innovation both within your own organizations and equally within Montana, within whatever ecosystem it is you run your business. Because make no mistake, there is an ecosystem that surrounds your business. And if you can harness it, that will be a differentiator for you. <coughs> and then finally, we're going to talk about why Montana is ripe for innovation. And that's not just because I think Senator Tester is a fantastic senator, but I think this is an amazing state with some amazing opportunity and supremely untapped potential. And that's at the end. That's why you should stay. So let's talk about why innovation matters. It's pretty straightforward. All net new jobs in the last 30 years were created by high growth startups less than five years old. Period. End of conversation. We're in possibly the worst economic Recession, recession since the Great Depression. I actually think that in 40 years from now, they will call it a Great Depression. This jobs recovery that you are seeing nicely here in Montana and we're seeing nationally just the inklings of is what we need more of. And if we're talking about how we can contribute to changing the world, I think we should be thinking about this. Mm -hmm. We as entrepreneurs do good stuff by creating jobs. And we as innovators have created all of the net new jobs in the last 30 years. So let's invest some time really valuing this space. It's also important to notice that this is a global opportunity, that globally it's recognized that if we can hard harness entrepreneurship and specifically innovation entrepreneurship, we'll not just raise the standard of living for those who are employed by that entrepreneurial endeavor, but for society at large. So you do good, you entrepreneurs. You do good just by being who you are and by doing what you do. And so we all need to care about you. So we had some Montana rock stars on the stage today. And I just always have to acknowledge where the entrepreneurs are. I sit and breathe in San Francisco on my daily basis, on a plane as much as San Francisco at this point. But what I know is that innovation is not unique to Silicon Valley. Regardless of what the press tells you, <clears throat> innovators exist everywhere. I have yet to travel to any country on this earth where I couldn't find an innovative entrepreneur ready to change the world. And that's a really important message that I have for this country as we're seeking an economic recovery. So kudos. Can we do a round of applause, please? to help you create a culture of innovation. And I think that a really important starting point is that we are in an unprecedented time of connectivity. And when we see ch times like this in our history, where there is such profound shifting of social structures and profound shifting of dialogue, it's really important for us all to challenge our assumptions and our beliefs. Because quite honestly, everything is up for grabs. And this is why I am here as your local heretic. I am a myth buster. If any of you have been following my tweeting today, you'll see I gleaned a whole lot of fantastic myth busting today from the panels that we heard. And I'm at Vosmick, and if any of you are tweeting. And yes, Senator is at John Tester, for any of you who want to follow him. I've been tweeting his name all morning. I bet he's trending at this point. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> but I think that it's really important that we listen to our heretics. Because at times like this, everything we thought we knew, I'm not so sure. I think the banking industry is a great example of one that we thought we knew, 
wow, what do we know? We're still learning. We're still trying to understand. So heretics like me, I don't know, we're, we're worth heeding. Having said that, you can also ignore me because I am, at times, a bit louder and a little bit more boisterous than others, and so I like to give people reasons to turn me off. So, first of all, I am not an entrepreneur. I am very entrepreneurial, but Astia was started 13 years ago by a woman named Kate Muther. I am not the founder of Astia. I never grew a company to a successful exit. I'm going to define terms for those in the room who don't know what an exit might be for your company. An exit would be your company is acquired by another set of investors or by another company. That's an exit. Your company may go public on a stock market. That's an exit. And I haven't done that. I have my master's in public policy, and probably I could add to that, I worked in the US Senate. I think that kind of disqualifies me from this conversation altogether. <laughs> and if you, you when I put this up in Silicon Valley, they kind of nod their head and, and start tweeting other things. <laughs> so, but if you recall, I said I was a bit of a heretic. And what I would say is this gives me the best perspective to talk to you about entrepreneurship. I'm married to a serial entrepreneur. And let me tell you something. The guy has no clue what has allowed him to succeed. But I sit on the outside as an observer with my background that's not at all entrepreneurial. And I can tell you that what I've mapped is some fantastic intelligence about how you can maintain a culture of innovation within your organization and around your organization. So as a heretic, I think you should listen to me. So I had this great opportunity recently, this last year, um, actually a once in a 100 year opportunity. I was invited as one of, um, as I understand it, about 170 individuals around the globe outside of IBM to attend their 100 year celebration. It was absolutely phenomenal and for uh, an executive who runs an organization working with entrepreneurs to participate in the centennial of a business it was a really interesting learning. But what I took away was actually my ears for heresy were perked when I heard something really interesting that validated a belief I had had. You see, at IBM, they had decided to try and measure group intelligence because they knew that they needed to continue innovating in the next 100 years. And for those of you who don't know the history of IBM, you know it started as a meat slicing company. And they got into technology because they wanted to be able to measure how wide the meat was going to be cut. And then now, one might argue they're not even really in technology. They're a service industry. Just interesting stuff. So for them, group intelligence matters. And, and they knew that you could measure individual intelligence. We've known that for almost 100 years. IQ is fairly translatable. So they brought in MIT, some really smart folks from MIT, really tall smart folks, this group of men, that presented their findings. And what they found is, number one, you can measure group intelligence. It has absolutely zero correlation to individual intelligence. Heresy. Absolute heresy, especially when you talk to my husband who believes he's the smartest guy in the room and he always hires people 10 times smarter than he is because that's going to build the best team. I learned that's not what builds a culture of innovation because you require smart teams to innovate. So what does it take? I'm dying to see your reaction. So number one, First of all, there were three things that correlated or directly translated into increased group intelligence and therefore innovation. Number one was this one. I just find this so interesting. The average social perceptiveness of the group. How well do we read each other? Do I get when you're listening? Do I get when you're not? Do I get when you're turning off what I'm saying and seeing, saying that I'm just a babbling fool? This matters to group intelligence. Imagine. Who knew? Not my husband. 
<laughs> Love this one. The evenness of the conversation. If any of you have ever been in a room of engineers who are trying to hack out some code, even is not a word that you would use to describe the behavior. Or in a lab of scientists who are trying to get to the <coughs> structure of DNA, how even was their conversation? And I know, but it matters. And then the third one, I'm in this room. This, it's at, um, in New York in uh, the Kennedy Center. And we are sitting in this vast room of suits, because you know IBM still suits. And there are maybe 10% women. You don't applaud? Come on. I stood up and gave it a standing ovation. Me and the other 10% of the women who were in the room. It was phenomenal. The proportion of women on the team directly contributed to group intelligence. Now, interestingly, the folks at MIT believe that numbers one and number two are directly linked to number three, that socially we teach women the skills of number one and number two, and therefore we bring that to the table. So we're needed for innovation. Isn't that interesting? I find it interesting. Because this is the opportunity for impact and creating your culture of innovation, which is it necessitates that women are present. The global opportunity is powerful. I was just at the APEC meetings with Secretary of State Clinton in August, <coughs> and it was estimated that within the Asia Pacific region, which is you know the US and then all the other folks in Asia, like China and Japan, it's estimated that between 6 to 14% we would see a 6 to 14% jump in GDP in those markets if women fully participated. Now, our good senator could tell us that's a huge economic impact that we could all use, don't you think? Just by ensuring that a population that's at the ready could participate. So you, creating your cultures of innovation, how do you make it happen? Let me introduce you to Astia, which is my social experiment. And I open source everything. I'm a real believer that when I learn something, I'm going to shout it from the mountaintops. Because, I don't know, I like to do sh shouting from mountaintops, I guess. <laughs> Astia, you heard at the introduction, is a community of men and women. This, by the way, is what innovation looks like. It cannot be all men and it cannot be all women. I said I was a heretic. You heard some people earlier talk about the importance of women's networks. I'm here to tell you the importance of gender inclusive networks. Mm -hmm. Astia is 50-50 through everything we do. If you look at my board of trustees, half men, half women. My board of advisors, half men, half women. The Astia advisor community around the globe, currently 45% women, excuse me, men, 55% men. But that's only because men rule the investment world. world. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. And what I've learned in that journey of creating this very socially constructed community is that the Astia performance rate that you heard cited in my introduction is unparalleled in the market. You might be reading about Y Combinators, I don't know if you do here, or Techstars, all these great programs for high growth entrepreneurs. They're success rate, and they have funds to directly invest in their companies. I don't have funds. I'm raising money from this angel group here at the end of the table for our companies. I don't have any money, and I am doubling their performance. They have about a 30% funding success rate. I have 60. Because of this. It's as simple as this. And it's interesting, because in our society here in the US, and it's true in Europe and India where Astia operates, men and women are still in separate business networks. This is a problem. It's a fundamental flaw in our business model. Let me tell you why. Okay, we have majority women in the room. Raise your hand if you believe you have men in your business network. Great. Keep your hand, no, keep it up. 
sorry, keep your hand up if those men in your business network are someone you would call if you were fired today. Okay. Keep your hand up if those men would call you if they were fired today. Therein lies the rub. About half of you put your hands down and the rest I would challenge that it doesn't happen. And the reason it matters, you heard investment decisions here at the end of the table, angel investment, that's the world, the universe of companies that I'm working with. Investment decisions that are high risk, high reward, have very few metrics that you can rely on. You can't look at credit score. It's, it's, it's a forward looking business. You're trying to measure opportunity, you're trying to measure team, you're trying to measure all these things that really, at the end of the day, can be mitigated by one thing, <clears throat> trust. Do you trust this individual that you're gonna write whatever size check for and to? Do you trust their team? Do you trust that they can execute? Are they the A team executing on a B idea? Are they the B team executing on a C idea? What are they? And that is why we need business relationships across genders because 95% of all venture capital is held by men. And if you're a woman entrepreneur, the likelihood that you have that trusted relationship that I just described with that 95% of the population, very slim. It is very slim that you will have that. But come to Astia and we'll help you build those. Or do it intentionally yourself. Take a look at your universe. Build your kitchen cabinet and make sure there are men at that table. But true to the model of innovation that we've learned about, creating that sustainable model of innovation, men and women at the table. I'll warn you, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> I just come coming off a two-day board retreat. Half men and half women is not easy. There are no business models out there. The closest thing is the Israeli military. <laughs> and because I'm public policy, I went and studied to take a look at what could be gleaned from the Israeli military, because they're practically 50-50. Interestingly, <laughs> when you look at entrepreneurial numbers, they're about 50-50 also for women's participation in entrepreneurship. Fourth noting, duly noted. What women need to grow high growth business is identical to their male counterparts. Mm -hmm. What is different is how they need to achieve it. Women need access to networks. And I don't mean networking. Things like this need to become intentional networking. Who are you here to meet? Who are you here to get to know? Who are the three people that you are gonna leave, go have coffee with, go have dinner with, go have a drink with, go have a conversation with, and see where it takes you. Three people, that's all you need to do, but make it work for you. Don't networking, do network. Because capital and expertise sit within the individuals. You heard fantastic SBA gentlemen say it, and I tweeted it right away. It is all about relationships. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. And it, by the way, is not rocket science. Rocket science is your innovation. Building your business, something we can do. And you need access to opportunity. I don't want to install an update. <laughs> access to opportunity, okay, this one I hate because there is a gender lens on this one. And I gotta tell you, I don't comfortably sit talking about women's entrepreneurship very often because I like to quickly get to the point that we're very much more alike than we are different. But there is this subtle difference, which is men and women still self-assess differently. I love that we're sitting here within a university setting because the latest research on this is out of the latest uh, university students. And it validates that as it was in my generation and the generations before me, women still take a look at their abilities differently than men do. Case in point. Young women were leaving the University of Wisconsin-Madison in droves uh, from science courses, excuse me, math and sciences, and they wanted to know why. And what they found were that young women who were getting C's 
these D's in their courses were not only dropping the coursework, they were dropping out of math and science as a major. Now, we only have a few men here, but I need you to represent men for a moment. If you were getting a B in a calculus course, would you not say you had passed? <laughs> I'm looking for some nodding. Would you say you passed? Thank you, Senator. Yes. Not only do men pass when they get B's, C's, D's, they are math whizzes. They use it for the furtherance of their career, a higher salary, whatever it is, because they passed. They achieved. Women get a woman B, and we assume we are not capable, and therefore we don't aspire as big. One of our entrepreneurs said it so well this morning. She said, plan for what you intend to be. Don't plan for the small business you are today. Figure out the mega business that you could be. What is your big opportunity? And measure yourself against that and map to that. The best way that I have found to achieve this goes back to my prior slide. When I sit side by side with men in the Aztec community, I self-assess differently. Not because they do anything, I just hear what they say about their history. And I say, wait a minute, I have that same experience. I have those same skills. Why am I not trying for the moon? How come I'm settling for sitting right here? And interestingly, the transformation for men is just as powerful. Because what men hear with the experience women as peers is, wow, she doesn't fully articulate all of her capabilities. I might have to listen more closely to what her skills and potential are. So my social experience benefits not just men and men, but also, excuse me, not just women, but men also. Because when you experience each other as peers, you change the world. <clears throat> so, what you've all been waiting for. I just love coming to visit places like Montana. First of all, it's gorgeous. You get beautiful snow. And you have a wicked smart population. I had the good senator's office pull some data for me. I will move over here. And Pam, wherever you are, thank you for your data. Right on. This is your women graduate students. You are 58% of all college, gra college graduate students, not graduates, excuse me, postgraduate students. So PhDs, MDs, MBAs, masters, and PhDs. Well beyond educated, you're 58%. Holy Moses, you are not the underrepresented. You are fully represented, ladies. Right on, thank you. This is not a new trend. The data that sent me, this is the way it's been for the last 10 years. Not new news. Okay, up and coming. This is the undergraduate population. And similarly, this has same, been pretty constant for the last 10 years. You are the majority of the undergraduates. I'm talking about the innovation economy. I'm talking about high growth. Here's my pipeline at the ready. Astias should be launching all over the place in Montana. Because what does it take to succeed within the innovation economy? It does take a skilled workforce. The exciting news, Senator, you got it. The bad news, Senator, here's where you're playing. Women in Montana, less than 5% of the invested companies, somewhere between 2 and 4%. Your opportunity, good sir. Your opportunity, ladies and gentlemen. My challenge to you is that I believe that Montana can create the next female Irv Weissman. And for those of you who don't know Irv Weissman, he's a Montana, Montana boy who now head, heads the stem cell research at Stanford and he's churning out innovation left and right. But I would say, ladies, I would expect to see a few female Irv Weissmans when I look at these numbers. And I'd expect to see more than the 
current number of applicants that I have at Astia from Montana, which is zero. And that's important to me. My goal at Astia, as I said, is to put myself out of business in 10 years. The reason I believe that I can do so, you just saw my pipeline. You just saw my opportunity for impact. Now I challenge you to join me. And if you're interested in becoming an entrepreneur who changes the world through her scalable, growable business, there are organizations and resources at the ready. Number one, the individual does not scale. You cannot do this alone. The person that asks the question, do not do it alone. It is too painful. It is unnecessarily painful. You've got great talent and expertise, and they were here on the panels today. And then there are organizations outside of your region that are at the ready. Astia, Techstars, Y Combinators. You don't have to leave your state. We're a network at the ready that's global. Springboard, a network at the ready that's global. Find your entrepreneurial ecosystem. Hold on to it with all your might. Because the other thing is that entrepreneurship is a crazy endeavor. There is no one that is going to validate you like another entrepreneur can validate you. So get yourself into the relationships that can validate and challenge you as an entrepreneur. Because everyone around you, including well, a whole lot of folks I won't mention, are going to tell you you're crazy and it can't be done. And they're not going to give you your money, their money, and they're not going to give you their time. So find those who can and will. But whatever you do, just do it. Put your stake in the ground. Own your competencies. Dare to be not this. That's where I end, and I open for questions. Absolutely. Anyone that takes a look at our applications, you send it to me, and my team hates when I do this. <laughs> I spoke last week at a thing and did the same thing, and I extended it. We will find a way to get you screened. Truly, I'm in this to get myself out of business. So the faster I can find you, and if I can customize your experience at Astia, yeah, bring it on. Thank you. We heard a panel earlier that was made up primarily of women who own lifestyle businesses, and I think they painted a pretty good picture of that being fairly compatible with having kids. High growth businesses, I have a whole different picture of the compatibility of that kind of lifestyle with having children, and I'm wondering if you can speak to your experience of women entrepreneurs who lead high growth businesses and have families and how they make that work. I love this question. I get to be a heretic again. Because, <laughs> well, first of all, I don't have kids, so I can look at this objectively. Quite honestly, I can, and, and very selfishly. Um, Sheryl Sandberg says it really well. Do not opt out before you need to opt out. And we have ample uh, examples of women that have children while they're growing a high growth business. but. The individual does not scale. You heard them all talk about the networks and resources they use. I'm going to give you just one example. But for the one I'm going to give you, I assure you I can multiply it times 10. Um, Jenny Zezet is my favorite example. And you can Google her. She was the founder CEO of Scout Labs. And she is a perfect prototype of a mother of three and how she did it. But Jenny will be the first to say she did it recognizing she can't do it all. So she moved her startup to Santa Cruz, California, which is where her mother lives. And her mother has been a really important resource in the growing of that business. Number two, Jenny says it on the ninth month of her third baby, um, was selling Scout Labs to Lithium. And that brought about interesting conversations around was she going to be able to sell this company while nine, month, do, nine months into a pregnancy. And not only did she do it, it's a fantastic exit for the investors and the entrepreneurs. Now, did she do it all? Was she at every single 
soccer match and every single school function. And I think she would be the first to admit that she wasn't at every single one. But between her and her husband, who is also an equal partner in her marriage, between the two of them, they certainly had it covered. And I think that Sheryl Sandberg's on this point is very salient, which is you do have to have partners. And you have to find them, and you have to embrace them, and make them a part of your life. It is not, and I don't believe even lifestyle business is about balance. I don't think women today are seeking balance. I think they're seeking integration. And I think integrating and understanding that both in the home and in the business, you cannot do it all, nor should you. And don't opt out simply because you also want to have children. And there are fantastic role models. Having said that, I still get VCs that ask the stupid ass question every single time. So are you thinking of having kids? Really? Really? So yeah, it's going to get asked. I don't know. We've got to change the face of what business looks like. And quite honestly, I think Jenny's a great example of a CEO because she had three kids and was a woman in business. And I think her kids, having met them, think she's an amazingly successful mommy, CEO mommy. It's an interesting thing. I absolutely will define it. So high growth is a very definable term without any numbers. <laughs> it is about size of market, paste speed to market, and then execution of that. So it is about a strategy that includes pace. You're not just creating a business, but you are thinking about a time horizon with that business. If you're a life science company, that's a longer time horizon than a, a next Twitter company, a technology company. But you have a pace. You have a notion of pacing it to market so that you know when you're going to see return on investment. The other one is the size of that market. Are you talking about a $100 million market? Are you talking about a billion dollar market? Are you talking about a $10 million market? And high growth is anything in the order of magnitude that an investor would see the return. And generally, an investor is going to look for 10 times the return. So you've got to think in those terms. And then I would add that from my perspective, high growth is always about innovation. And I don't necessarily mean technology innovation. We get obsessed with technology innovation. I'm a real believer in business innovation. And if you look at the life science and healthcare sector, right now it's a sector in crisis. There is no investment going into re research and development of new drugs. We need that. We need our cancer drugs. How are we going to get them there? The best innovations right now in life sciences, from my perspective, are business model innovations that are bootstrapping that company to a scale that then investment can get, get in. So I'm a real believer that great entrepreneurs innovate on both fronts. Think Richard Branson and what he did, he's, is doing with the airline industry. I think we were talking about that a little bit earlier. Much of his innovation is simple things, like you're sitting in your seat and you can swipe your card and order food then. And I was talking to a pilot last night. They're making like $18 a passenger on us swiping our cards in our seat. What kind of innovation was that? That has nothing to do with flying. Everything to do with business model. Way in the back, gentlemen. Yes, I can't hear you. <laughs> well, Sharon, a, a great talk with the. I just have one quibble with you. Uh, you I can't imagine only one. Well, a, a serious one. Okay. You ask people to shoot for the moon. I'm not sure that's always a good idea. I sold my business because it got too big. I think there's great value in small business, and that's what this conference is about. And that does not mean getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That means finding a lifestyle and an enjoyment in what you do. Two different things. We don't all have to be conglomerates. We don't want to be Goldman Sachs. Thank you. <laughs> started in my talk was talking about customer segmentation. And what I did was define for you the customer I serve. Without disqualifying your, your point about life science, uh, excuse me, lifestyle businesses, I would highlight that every company I serve is 
or starts as a small business. And there are very unique hurdles to small business and very unique opportunities. But let me highlight that I'm also speaking to an audience of women. And women are currently half of all sm small businesses. Why would I be encouraging more? We are only, where's my little bitty women? We are 4% of high growth. We're not the Goldman Sachs's. I look forward to being able to have that problem. But we're not even close. We're 4% of job creators. And by the way, this there was a number in there that I challenged, which is I don't care about women owned because I want you to raise money and grow this business properly. I care about women led. When Meg Whitman was CEO of eBay, that was a woman led company. Did she own 50%? No. Did she own 51%? No. She owned 4%. That's a woman that company, that's creating jobs, that's important to me for the customer I'm serving. So I agree, good sir, and I'm just not serving you. <laughs> one more? Okay, I can take one more question, so you have to raise your hand firmly so I see it first. Oh, this is good, nobody has a question. You're not gonna, oh, wait a back, yes. Hi, my name is Molly Bradford. I own a small software startup and advertising company in town. And I was going to ask this question in the earlier panel, but I think it's relevant for you as well, Sharon. What I'm wondering is, at what point do you know that you are relevant to the label of early stage startup? In this state, there's a lot of bootstrapping that goes on or um, small uh, traditional financing through a bank. And sometimes as I navigate the ABCs of MCDC, READC, uh, BREDD, ASTIA, CEO, ANGEL, this, that, and the other thing that I'm feeling pretty good about actually right now, I still don't think I'm relevant for your project or for ANGEL funding as I read through just now your web website on my phone or Frontier Angel website. I think, I need some money. I have an excellent product. I'm ready to go. I'm in some really big talks with local and national companies, and I need funds now, but I'm not, I don't think I'm qualified. How do you know when you are? Bless you, bless you, bless you. You gotta ask a man. You are currently <laughs> self-assessing way too low. And by the way, this happens all the time with women entrepreneurs. Oh, I read ask to your qualifications. I don't think I qualify. You qualify? based upon what I've just heard. But more importantly, one of the entrepreneurs said it really well, and apologies, I can't remember which one, but she said that you need to define your path for yourself. You need to define your exit, I think was what she said, but I don't know if you need to define the exit, but you certainly need to define what you want to be. And if you tell me that you're relevant to an investment community, I'll help you translate that. You don't have to be able to tell me how. You can tell me that you want to be as big as whatever you want to be, and I can pull back the curtains of venture capital and help you understand it. It is not rocket science. And most entrepreneurs, female entrepreneurs, and, and this is the gender aspirational thing, opt out simply because they don't know the terms. So an ASTI exists so that I can translate your opportunity to their community, and then you can pursue it or not. And along that journey, many of our entrepreneurs at ASTIA not many of them, but a number of that 40% that don't secure funding opt to instead do a lifestyle business. And they say, you know what, now that I've learned that much about venture capital and high growth, I don't want to do it. But at least they're making an educated decision as opposed to just opting out. And so I tell you, you're qualified because you're asking. Come on in, learn a little bit more, and see what's right for you. And I would highlight that what you just said about your company Drop the word small at the start. You started with your, your software business here in Montana. It's good enough for me. Well, Sharon, thank you very, very much for your insight and, and, uh, and vision. And uh, I just, I just very much appreciate you taking time out of what I know is a very, very busy, busy schedule to be with us here today in Missoula, Montana. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for being here today. Uh, this is. Uh,
this has been a, a good session, um, and, and the fact that you're here shows your commitment to starting and growing your businesses and to creating jobs and to keep Montana's economy moving along. Uh, most of you know that I'm a family farmer, uh, and most of you, I think you know that um, the co-owner of our business is my wife, Sharla, and uh, I know how successful women business owners can be. Um, my commitment is to keep working for Main Street, keep putting Montana's agenda before everybody else's, and uh, my role as your senator is to make sure that we hold our government accountable at the high Montana standards, uh, common sense, transparency, hard work, and the kind of hard work that each and every one of you do every day, the kind of hard work that we heard up here today by many of the panelists. Uh, my role is to keep standing up to special interests, to put citizenship above partisanship, and I think we can all agree that that's a Montana value and that's why we're here, to get our Montana economy moving again, to create jobs, and with your help and with your good ideas and your commitments to business, that is happening and will continue to happen. Um, as I said this morning, it was a, it was a listening session uh, uh, with small businesses that, that, uh, that led to this event uh, some four years ago. Uh, just last week, uh, we, uh, we passed the bipartisan tax holiday that's going to help some 600,000 Montanans so the tax increase doesn't occur in your paycheck next month. Uh, next order of business is, is something that uh, some people in this country feel is a thing of the past. I don't. And that's to reform the Postal Service to make sure it's around for a while. Uh, Montana's Postal Service in a rural state like Montana is critically important. And improving our economy is going to take working together, something uh, that I think folks in Washington can learn uh, from folks in Montana. I recently had the opportunity to turn up to, to team up with my friend uh, Pat Toomey, who's uh, a senator from Pennsylvania, is from the other side of the aisle for those who keep score. And we teamed up to introduce a bill that will allow more access to capital markets for startup businesses. Uh, and that's, that's it is a very good thing. Because that's going to help Main Street. It's uh, it's it's about working together, and uh, and I think that uh, uh, if if we continue or in Washington D.C.'s these case at least start to work together, I think that we have a very very uh, a vibrant future ahead of us uh, in this country. Uh, my next small business opportunity workshop is going to be in Great Falls on March 12th. It's uh, it's going to be focused on agriculture. Uh, and it should be a good one. I, I thank you again for being part of this event, especially traveling on the roads. You traveled this morning to hear some of you folks talk. You traveled a pretty good distance to get here, and I appreciate that. I want to say a special thanks, and by the way, I didn't get to thank appropriately the panelists that were up here. Some of them had to go. Uh, some of them are still here. But I want to thank you very, very much for your good information that you conveyed today. Uh, critically important. Uh, by the way, you may have noticed uh, there's a video camera there that was videoing this, uh, the highlights of this presentation uh, that should be online at tester.senate.gov slash workshop, uh, hopefully as early as next week. And, uh, and that'll be good in case you saw something here that you can't remember exactly what happened. You can go back and review it. Uh, the day is not over with yet. Um, it is for this session, but remember there are booths and tables set outside. Uh, and uh, Feel free to, to visit with those folks. Feel free to talk to other business people that are here. And, and just finally, uh, a special thanks to Sharon for coming today. Uh, we very much appreciate you uh, uh, in a busy travel schedule being able to come here to Montana. Thank you all for being here. Good luck. Safe travels. And we'll see you soon. Thank you.